Okay, so welcome everyone to the first lecture of the cardiovascular system from USMLE Step 1 First A 2021. Thank you so much for joining the class. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? <clears throat> Okay, very good, very well. Now, uh, thank you so much for joining the lecture. Thank you so much for completing your transactions. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Now, before I begin the lecture over here, did you guys get time to revise the endocrinology system? If I know. Did, any, did anyone get some time to revise the endocrinology system? Okay, good. So today we're gonna do a couple of endocrinology questions towards the end of the lecture. But before we do this, let's not wait any further and let's begin the lecture for today. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. So today we're gonna to begin with the cardiovascular system. Uh, we will be reading the text from first day 2021, step-by-step, step, word by word. We will, we will be using um, two different uh, color schemes for the entire text. We will be using red to identify the questions and blue we will use to identify the potential questions for the best set. Now, having said that, cardiovascular system is one of the most highest yield systems of the US Army Step 1. The amount of questions that are structured from the cardiovascular systems are very high. And uh, most of the questions are basically going to come from the physiology, pathology and pharmacology. But uh, every system in the first day basically starts with um, the embryology. So that's what we're going to begin with. Now, um, before I do this, one more question. Did everyone get the subscription for UWorld? Yes or no? Online UWorld? Did everyone get the subscription for online UWorld? Yes, okay, good. So um, just wanna talk about UWorld very quickly. Okay, I just wanna talk about UWorld very, very quickly and I want you guys to understand the importance of, of the UWorld. The thing is, um, the majority of the questions which you guys are supposed to answer in your exam, in your step one exam, you will be getting it from the UWorld. So over here, if I talk about the UWorld step one, then the UWorld step one has close to around 4,000 questions, yes or no? So um, the thing that, the way that we basically ask you to do the U world is try to start the U world first in tutor mode. Yes, the first thing is we want you to do the U world in tutor mode. What does this mean? That, that means that whenever you do one question, you either select the right or the wrong answer, and then you basically read why the right is right and why the wrong is wrong. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So basically when we study the U world, we want to we want you guys to focus on two things. First of all, what we want you to focus on the fact that, that why your right answer, the answer that you chose is right. And if you choose the wrong answer, why the wrong answer is wrong and which one is the correct answer, and then you move on forward. So the thing is, if you guys have your exam in the next one year, if you guys have your exam in the next one year, for example, in the next eight to 12 months, if you do 40 questions every day, how long will it take? How many days will it take for you to finish the U world first pass? Simple, the answer is 100, no? The answer is 100. So some people at one point, every day they start doing 40 questions, right? Every day they start doing 40 questions and they get so good at this that at tutor mode, they can start doing 60 questions or 65 questions or 70 questions. And they finish the first pass U world in 100 days. In the first pass U world, after you finish your U world, you have to do it you have to reset the entire subscription. 
and you then you do it again from the get-go. You do it again from scratch, and then you do second pass you will. Okay. So obviously your scores are supposed to be better in your second pass because in your first pass, you took your time. So in the second pass, you will be doing your U world in timed mode. As simple as that. And after doing the second pass U world, the thing that I basically would want my student to do is in the third pass, that is you do it for the third time, but this time you only do the wrong questions. You only do the wrong questions. So after doing all of these, then finally we are ready to somewhat assess our situation, whether we are ready to sit for the exam or not. Does anyone have questions? Regarding you world? No. no. Now, if you guys are uh, serious about sitting for the exam in the next one year, then by now, you should already have your subscription for your online U world. If you do not have subscription for your online U world yet, we suggest you get the subscription right away, right away, right now, and you start with your questions. And um, since we are done as a group of students who started the third batch, since we are done with endocrinology, right? Since we're done with endocrinology, I would expect you guys to start doing the U world endocrinology in tutor mode. Is there anyone over here who has already started doing the U-World endocrinology in tutor mode? Yes or no? Yes, okay, very good. So the next question is how many questions are we doing every day on tutor mode? How many questions are we doing over here on tutor mode every day? Should we do self-assessments after first pass? No, we should not do self-assessments after first pass. I would suggest you do self-assessment after second pass. 40 questions every day, okay. So Dr. Allen is up to 40, Dr. V is up to 40, okay, so good. So you guys are uh, doing pretty well, thank you so much. So the rest of the students, I, I highly, highly suggest that your exam is in the next uh, six to eight months or eight to 12 months, then please get your subscription for UWorld right away and uh, start your preparations accordingly. Okay, uh, having said that, are we ready to begin our lecture, yes or no? Yes, is everyone ready to begin the lecture? Okay, good. So let's start, let's start talking about embryology. Okay, so what do we mean by the development of the heart? First and foremost, let's talk about embryology as a whole. First, the, what are the steps of human development? The steps of human, de human development are very simple. So we have the mother cells, and then we have the father cells, right? We have the ovum, the sperm, and then after that, what, what do we get? The next process is, the next process is the process of fertilization, yes or no? And then the formation of blastocysts. From blastocysts, there is the formation of the zygote, yes or no? Right, we have the formations of the zygote. And then when, when we have the formation of the zygote, we have the implantation of the zygote in the mother's uh, posterior wall of the uterus uh, with the help of um, some membranes, right? And um, after the implantation, we have the, we have the beginning of the weeks. So, we're, so what happens in the first week? In the first week of human development, we have uh, this entire process of implantation, blastocyst formation, zygote formation, and everything else that's taking place. What happens in week two of human development? In week two of human development, we have the formation of basically two high yield layers, which are known as epiblasts and hypoblasts, right? Uh, this, this is the formation of the bilaminar disc. We call this the bilaminar disc. What happens in the week three of human development? We have the formation of the trilaminar disc, right? So from bilaminar disc, we have the formation of trilaminar disc. In the trilaminar disc, we have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. That is the formation of the three germ layers. And if I have to ask you over here, ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm, can you guys tell me very quickly from which layer that does the heart develop from? The heart develops from the layer of? Can any, anyone tell me very quickly, very good. The heart develops from the layer of the mesoderm. It's a mesodermal development. Yes or no? 
whenever we talk about mesodermal development over here very quickly, we need to keep in mind that if there is any abnormality of human development, especially from the layer of the mesoderm, then we get a constellation of sign syndrome, which we call them as vectoral diseases, right? Ver vertebral diseases, anal atresia, cardiovascular problem, tachyoesophageal problem, renal problems, and limb defects. Yes or no? So whenever you have a patient, a young, uh, young neonate, who is delivered with a constellation or a combination of vertebral problems, anal atresia, along with cardiovascular problems, then you need to start thinking about the fact that the process of mesodermal development was most possible, was most probably hampered, right? Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay, so that's it. So mesodermal development is the development of the heart. So that's the first question. And for that, okay, you need to remember this, right? So uh, red star for this one, a red light for this one. Okay, so it's a mesodermal development. So are we clear about how the heart is basically coming and taking into place, yes or no? Vectoral defect. Vectoral stands for vertebral disease, anal atresia, cardiovascular problems, tracheoesophageal problems, renal defect, and limb defect. Okay. Now, let's start talking about the process of heart morphogenesis. Heart morphogenesis is basically the development of the heart. And uh, whenever we say morphogenesis, then what do we basically mean? Whenever we say morphogenesis, we are basically talking about a couple of things over here. We're talking about first the de development of the heart. And then another thing that we're talking about is that we're talking about the cardiac looping. Now, cardiac looping as a whole is not high yield for USMD step one, that how, which portion is developing into what. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about cardiac looping in details over here in this portion of heart and biology. The fact that I said that it's not high yield, meaning that you will not be asked about uh, the process of how the cardiac looping is basically taking place. Always remember this, okay? Always remember this. Do I have everyone's attention? I'm, I, I need to say something very, very high yield, very important. Do I have everyone's attention? Yes or no? Always remember this from first stage, step one. From first stage, what are the, what are the topics or what are the things that you need to know absolutely? Need to know. And there is no other um, replacement for, for you to not know this and sit for the exam. First and foremost, always, always know a pathology or a physiology that are associated with the two Ds. What are the two Ds? Any pathology, any, uh, any physiology or any uh, development or embryology that is related to either a disease or drugs is high yield for your exam okay for example if you're if you're um, reading a physiology and you're not really sure whether this is high yield or not high yield for your exam then just ask yourself whether there are any diseases that could be associated with this uh, with, with the with this physiology if the answer is yes, that yes, there is a disease that could be associated with this physiology, then 100% is extremely high yield for your exam and this will be asked. For all other physiologies and pathways and processes of embryology that are not associated with any disease nor any process of drugs, you can easily try to understand that that physiology holds low yield. Are we clear? Yes or no, everyone? Okay. Okay. So let's start talking about the heart. Now, heart development, heart is basically the first organ that will develop in the human body. We know that the, that the timing from the organ development is basically the three to eight weeks. And this is the, the time period where we ask mothers to stay away from teratogenic drugs. We ask mothers to stay away from any sort of, um, any sort of toxicants or any sort of stimulants or any other drugs that will hamper the organ development. After 10th week of, gest of gestation, the lifestyle of the mo mothers can be a little bit more relaxed. 
But from this time period, this three to eight weeks, the mothers need to be really careful. Why? Because this is the time period of the development of the major organs in the human body. So this is the first functional organ. It will develop at week four. Please underline this, that this is the week four of human development. And it beats spontaneously at week six. It beats spontaneously at week six. So it basically develops at week four and it starts beating at week six, okay? The heart starts beating at week six. So if it starts beating at week six, for example, if we do an ultrasound or an ultrasonogram, can we hear the heartbeat before uh, four to six weeks or, or six weeks? The answer is no. So basically, this is the clinical importance of this one. Okay, so this is the clinical importance. Next one is cardiac looping. What is cardiac looping? Cardiac looping is basically the heart tube loop to establish the left right polarity. It begins in week four of development. And the thing is, heart always develops first on the uh, right side, right? And then when the heart develops on the right side, right, with the help of some uh, connective tissues, right, especially we call them uh, dynein arms, right, right, microtubules and microfilament, with the help of this, the heart kind of shifts from the right to the left. So it loops like this. So it loops from the right side to the left side. So it loops all the way like this and it assumes and it takes its primary anatomical position, right? That is with the apex of the heart being at the left fifth interposal space. So that's that. So this is the, so the thing is the fact that the cardiac, the heart basically loops around to the right side of the, of the thoracic cavity to the left side of the thoracic cavity. This takes place with the help of some connective tissues, which we call them as dynein arms, right? Now, specifically, this is associated with the disease and we all know the name of the disease, right? If there is an individual who has a disease, for example, let's say primary ciliary dyskinesia, where we have problems of the dynein arms, right? Then we can get, then we can get a disease where the heart is seen in the right side instead of the left side. So the apex of the heart, the heartbeat will actually be instead of the left fifth interval space, it will be at the right fifth interval space, right? And these are questions in your step one exam, which you will get where they will tell you that in cardiac auscultation, we, the, heart, the heartbeat is uh, heard at the right fifth interval space. Whenever you see a question where they say that the heartbeat is, is heard at the right fifth interval space, I need you guys to immediately think about the problem that the patient has a dextrocardia and is suffering from cardiogenic syndrome, which is primary ciliary dyskinesia, right? Some other problems that this patient of the cardiogenic syndrome will have is that if they have primary ciliary dyskinesia, then not only do they have dextrocardia, cardiogenic syndrome, they also have immotile cilia syndrome, we call this, because the, the cilia in the respiratory tract, they have difficulty beating because they have problem with the movement of the cilia. And we all know what cilia is. For example, if this is the respiratory tract, cilia are hair-like projections. These are parts of our normal defense mechanism. They beat back and forth, right? And their function is that over here, every cilia is associated with, a, with droplets of mucus. So the mucus basically traps any foreign organism or any dust particles that we breathe in through the air. And when the cilia moves back and forth, this allows the mucus to go all the way up from the respiratory tract. And either we can cough it out, we can spit it out, or we can swallow it in our esophagus, right? Isn't this the process of how basically we cough? Yes. Does, does anyone know the process of coughing? Does anyone know how we cough, okay, the so for example, this is the lungs, right? This is the respiratory tract. Over here, we have the vocal cords, right? In the vocal cords, we have the supraglottis, glottis, subglottis. This is this portion of muscle are the glottic group of muscles. And we have the respiratory tract over here, right? And in this respiratory tract, we have the cilia, which are, which are beating with the mucus. So now what is the process of coughing? Coughing is basically 
First of all, if you think about the process of cough, the first step is, first of all, you take a deep breath in. So you take a deep breath in, the air goes, right? And then you close the glottis, the glottis is closed, right? And the air kind of circulates in your respiratory tract for a while, right? And then all of a sudden you open your glottis, you open your glottis and there's forceful expulsion of the circulating air, right? And there's a coughing sound, the sound coughs. And whenever you cough, this forceful expulsion is basically taking all the mucus from the lower respiratory tract all the way up and expelling it outwards. This is the process of cough, which is a defense mechanism. Yes or no, did you guys understand this? Okay. Did you guys understand this process? Okay. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this is if there is a patient who comes to you with primary ciliary dyskinesia, will they have difficulty in coughing and getting rid of the dust, dust particles? Yes or no? The answer is? The answer is yes. Okay, so what will they have? Not only will they have dextrocardia, they will have recurrent, recurrent respiratory tract infections. Okay, then they will also have another problem. What is that problem they, they will have? Infertility, yes or no? Males will have infertility because the sperm will not be able to move properly. Females will have infertility because the cilia in the fallopian tubes will not be able to move properly and bring the ovum forward for the process of fertilization to occur. So that's that. Now, okay. Can you guys name another disease such as Cartagena syndrome, uh, which has the, which has very similar sign symptoms but it does not have dextrocardia, very good. The name of that disease is cystic fibrosis, right? Okay. And if anyone is aware of USMLE, then how, we, how important is cystic fibrosis for um, USMLE step one? Important or very important? Important or not important? Very important, very, very, very important, okay? So write down your homework, please. Homework, write down your homework. Okay, homework. Okay, so you guys might be thinking, why am I giving you homework at the beginning of the lecture? The reason being is because I'm going to forget about this. I just want to give you guys the homework. Homework. Homework is watch a video, cystic fibrosis versus cartagena syndrome. We'll talk about this later uh, at one point when, when we study because we do not have the time right now. Okay? But if you guys get the time, please study this. Homework is cystic fibrosis versus cartagena syndrome. I need you guys to study this one and this one, not from first aid, because we'll talk about these things from first aid and you'll do that with me. What you can do is you can, you can go to YouTube and watch the videos on cystic fibrosis, which is a five minute video on cardiogenic syndrome, which is also a five minute video, so 10 minutes of your entire day. Especially there's a channel called Osmosis that has very good explanation of the diseases. So if you guys can to clear your concept, please try to go through those videos. Okay, let's move forward to septation of the heart. Okay, let's move forward to the separation of the heart. So this entire thing over here, I'm going to use my blue, uh, my blue marker. Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly what the red ones are. So let's begin. Septation. So basically, now we're talking about the development of the heart. Now, first and foremost, we know that at first, when the when there is development of the heart, the heart it had basically has heart basically has to be converted into four chambers. Yes, the heart basically has to convert it to into four chambers. That is the atrium, the ventricles, meaning the right and left atrium and the right and left ventricles. So this is exactly what we're going to study right now, how the heart is, how, how the heart is uh, basically uh, divided into the four chambers. So this portion, we're going to talk about the first one, that is the how the heart is developed into, into the two upper chambers, that is the left and the right atrium. So if we have to do this, then we have to know how there is the development of the interatrial septum. So that's basically what we're gonna talk about. Now, first and foremost, if you see this one, what do you see? We see that when the heart develops at week four, and even before the heart starts beating, right? We have an entire single chamber, yes or no? We have only one chamber over here, that is the atriums. And what's happening is that the heart basically cannot push the blood from the right ventricle to the lung because why can anyone tell me why in babies why we cannot push the blood from the right ventricle to the lung the answer is because that in babies we cannot push the 
uh, blood from the right ventricle all the way to the lungs because all the vessels of the lungs are constricted. And since the lungs are not expanded properly, they will not allow proper blood to flow. And this will prevent the blood to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. So most of the blood will go from the right atrium to the left atrium, yes? And then what happens after uh, the baby is born? The first thing that the baby does is what? The first thing that the baby does is cry, yes or no? Okay. So what happens is when the baby cries, does the baby inhale a huge amount of air? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So when the baby cries, the baby inhales a huge amount of air and that inhalation of the air will expand the lungs of the babies, allowing the vessels to dilate. And that's when the blood will start flowing from the right ventricle to the lungs, then from the lungs to the left atrium, from the left, left atrium to the left ventricle, and then they will follow the normal primary systemic circulation. Okay, so in the beginning, we have one full atrium, you have right atrium, and there is no division as you can see, but we do have a formation of this one small thing over here. We do have a formation of this one small thing, which is, which is shown that there's a formation of a septum primum. Okay, so at first there is nothing except an entire ventricle and there is a formation of a septum primum. And the septum primum will grow and it will grow towards the dorsal endocardial cushion. Okay, so over here, they will start growing the septum primum and they will try to reach the dorsal endocardial cushion. This is the, this is the first step. What happens in this in the second step? In the second step over here, the septum primum will, this is the septum primum, this was, grow, this was growing from over here. This will come down and try to get attached to the dorsal endocardial cushion. But midway, what will happen is whenever, when it's going down, there will be formation of another sort of, uh, an, another sort of membrane. This next membrane that will form after septum primum is ostium secundum, okay? They will form after septum primum. Now, first and foremost, um, if we have the formation of septum primum, okay, if we have the formation of septum primum, for example, this is the left atrium, this is the left and right atrium. This is the right atrium, this is the left atrium. This is the dorsal endocardial portion. This is the septum that is growing over here. Now, first and foremost, just answer me this. Does this ball of atrium, does this have any foramen as of yet, if there is no septum? Yes or no? Do you see any foramen over here? Yes or no? No, very good. But when I do this, now do you see a foramen? Yes. Yes. This is the, this is the foramen, okay? What do you mean by the word foramen? Foramen basically means pathway. Yes, foramen basically means a pathway. So when do we have a pathway? We only have a pathway whenever we have an obstruction. Yes or no? Okay, so that's it. So there's a pathway whenever we have an obstruction. This is the obstruction, the, se the septum primum is the obstruction. If there is no obstruction, then there is no pathway, as simple as that. So the septum primum will grow down towards the endocardial cushion, and this will create the first foramen. This is the foramen primum. This is what I was trying to explain over here, okay? So that's that. Now, after this, when the septum primum comes down from, uh, from here to here, and there's formation of, os uh, of foramen secundum or ostium secundum, at this point, do we have two foramens or one foramen? The answer is we have two foramens, very good. And what do we call the second foramen? So what happens is at one point, the septum primum will keep on moving downwards. And do we get closure of the foramen primum? Yes or no? Do we get closure of the foramen primum? Yes, okay. So once again, heart, atrial chambers, no foramen, no septums, then formation of septum primum, formation of foramen primum, septum primum will go down at one point. At this spot, we can see two foramens, but at one point, 
the septum primum will bind to the dorsal endocardial cushion and the foramen primum will obviously disappear. And the only foramen that will be left behind is the foramen or ostium secundum. Are we clear up to number three? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Then what happens next? Let's see what happens next. What happens next is that is what happens next is that over here, by now, what do we get? By now, we all we have already we already have an obstruction, and we already have a pathway. Right? We already have a pathway that's that's taking place. But having said this, um, foramen or ostium, right, <coughs> has to be strengthened. Basically, there has to be formation of a more stronger membrane. There is a formation. There has to be a formation of a stronger membrane. This stronger membrane is basically when the foramen secundum will stay, and at the same time, there will be development of septum secundum. There will be there will, there will be development of septum secundum. So, do not get confused. Uh, ostium secundum and septum secundum they're not the same thing. Ostium secundum is the primary weak membrane. Septum secundum is the second portion of membrane, which is basically stronger, and they will uh, they will basically form the stronger uh, the the remaining portions of the interapial septum. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Are we clear? Yes. So the septum secundum will form, and the septum secundum will try to make sure that the foramen secundum over here is closing at one point, and as you can see, the septum secundum will form over here, right? And over here, this there's also a portion of the septum secundum. This is the remaining portion of the septum primum. And this space in between the two septum secundums, this is the space of foramen ovale, right? And we all know what the function of the foramen ovale is. Foramen ovale is basically the pathway that is allowing the blood to flow from the right side to the left side so that the blood doesn't have to go through the pulmonary uh, to the pulmonary circulation because the pulmonary circulation the vessels are too constricted for the blood to flow properly so in order to maintain the normal circulation the blood has to flow interatrially from one atrium to another atrium as simple as that okay so let me just repeat all of this information one more time so that you guys are aware of this okay is everyone ready <laughs> First and foremost, some of the things that we have already talked about, the heart develops at which peak? The heart is developed at, the heart is developed at week four. The heart beats at week, at which week? Heart starts be beating at week six. Okay, how do we remember this? Four, for the four chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and six, four, Bix. Bix sounds like beats. So hard, hard Bix at week six, as simple as that. Okay, now what's happening? Now we're talking about the formation of the interatrial septum. First of all, this is the heart. This is the right side. This is the left side. Okay, this is the dorsal endocardial cushion. What is the name of this one? The first membrane that's, that's forming. Pass answers, please. This is the formation of the this is the formation of the foramen primum, right? And this is called septum primum. Yes, the septum primum will go down towards what? This is called what? The, the septum primum will go down towards the, fast as it is, dorsal endocardial cushion. Very good. Please remember this. this is a question. Septum primum will move downwards towards which, uh, towards uh, which group of cells or towards what the answer is, dorsal intercardial cushion. After the septum primum comes and it and it moves over here, there's formation of another septum over here. Okay, before the septum primum comes to the dorsal intercardial cushion, this foramen is called what? This is called foramen primum. And then, then what happens? Then the septum primum basically comes to the dorsal intercardial cushion and there's formation of foramen secundum, right? This is septum secundum, and this is this foramen is called foramen secundum. And then after this, what happens? We have we have septum primum, septum secundum, 
and we have another one over here. Okay, this is, this, the, uh, I mean, this is the ostium secundum, not septum secundum, and this is the septum secundum. So the black one is ostium secundum, this one is septum secundum. And then after we have the septum secundum forming over here and here, now this foramen secundum is converted to which one? Now this new foramen, this one is called foramen ovale. Okay, so in, in the baby's interatrial membrane, how will it look like in the baby's interatrial membrane? The baby's interatrial membrane will look something like this. We have septum secundum and septum secundum, and we have a little portion of ostium primum and a little portion of ostium secundum. This is the, this is the movement of the blood through the foramen ovale. And the septums and the ostiums, they will act as valves, allowing the blood to flow from only in only one direction. That is from the right side to the left side. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. We have a question from Dr. Sana who said, oh, how is foramen secundum formed? Foramen secundum, how is foramen secundum formed? Can anyone answer this for, for me? Yes or no? How is foramen secundum formed? I'm gonna repeat myself one more time. Dorsal endocardial cushion, ostium, ostium primum, foramen primum. Ostium primum comes, moves down towards the dorsal endocardial cushion. And then we have the formation of another membrane, which we say ostium secundum. Now this space <coughs> in between ostium secundum and ostium primum is called foramen secundum. Are we clear, yes or no? Yeah. Now, do you guys remember at the beginning of the lecture, I said, which physiologies are important? Whenever, whenever a physiology is associated with two Ds, that is drugs and disease, you, you are, you're welcome to go Okay, so whenever a physiology is associated with a drug or a disease, that is high yield. Now, why is this, or why is this so important to understand the formation of the septation of the, cha of the chambers? It's important to talk about the formation of the septation of the, of the chambers because after birth, what happens? After birth, shouldn't we have closure of the foramen ovale? Yes or no? The, this foramen, shouldn't it close? Yes, this foramen, it should close completely right? It should close completely like this. That is the formation of the interatrial septum. Now, um, over here, after birth, if we do not have fusion of septum primum with septum secundum, so failure of fusion of septum primum with septum secundum after birth will give rise to a very high yield disease, which is known as patent <laughs> foramen ovale, right? Patent for foramen ovale. Now, what is patent foramen ovale? Patent foramen ovale means that this foramen, the word patent, what do we mean by the word patent? Patent basically means, um, patently, patent basically means still working or open, right? Means that the foramen ovale is still working, it's still open. So if it's, if it's still open, then what's happening? That means that the blood is still flowing from the right side to the left side by the one-way valve. So the thing is, patent foramen ovale can be of two things. I mean, this can have two consequences. The number one consequence is the most common consequence of patent foramen ovale. That is um, your spontaneous closure. A lot of our general population, they already have patent form in ovale, but they, since they do not have any symptoms, so then they close spontaneously, so there is no issue. The second one with patent form in ovale is that this small piece of opening in the middle, this allows blood to flow from the right side to the left side. Now, why is this an issue? This is an issue because 
If paid in forum and ovali stays for a long period of time, patients can get a sort of an embolism, which we say as paradoxical emboli. What do we mean by paradoxical emboli? <laughs> okay, let me talk about this concept very quickly. Okay, let me talk about this concept very quickly. For example, over here, let's say that this is a patient. Okay, this is a patient. This patient has a patent foramen ovale, okay? And this is the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient. Over here, let's say that the patient has a cholesterol emboli or an embolism in, in one of the um, deep veins or one in one of the arteries. At one point, this, uh, this, this cholesterol emboli or this atherosclerotic plaque or, or the thrombosis or whatever it is, due, due to uh, high circulation, a portion of this thrombosis can actually go to the inferior vena cava, to the right atrium, right? And usually when something like this goes from the right atrium, it will, in a normal human being, it will go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, from the right ventricle to, to the lungs. So while it does that, emboli are basically broken down into smaller matters and they do not produce any symptoms. But in a, in a patient with patent foramen ovale, when the emboli goes to the <coughs> right atrium, and if there's a patent foramen ovale, they will move from here to here. So it basically moves from the right side to the left side. From the left side, they can easily go all the way to the central nervous system or to the systemic circulation, especially paradoxical embolides are basically known for going to the brain, right? Because the brain is basically the first, uh, e the first closest organ that is situated to the heart for, for the blood to flow to. So from the left ventricle, they'll go and then they'll have an embolic stroke, as simple as that. Okay. So, so that's all about uh, paradoxical emboli and um, your septum receptations. Now let's underline the questions from over here. Okay. So first and foremost, um, I'm sure you guys have understood the physiology. So please read this at your own time. <coughs> All the steps which I have mentioned are mentioned over here. Okay. So please read this. And uh, keep in mind that um, you only have to understand this. You do not have to remember this. So please try to understand this. And uh, that's that. What you do have to remember is the disease associated with this. That is patent foramen ovale. Okay. It's caused by <coughs> failure of fusion of septum primum and, sep and septum secundum. Okay. One more thing. One more thing. Hi, all over here. Uh, let me talk about uh, let me talk about a typical step one question. Okay. So, um, let me talk about something like this. Do you guys understand that step one questions, USMLE, they have a tendency of constructing questions. So they will have a question, right? For example, they'll start the question with either a male or a female, the age, the clinical uh, features, or basically the first chief complaint, right? And then in the answers, they will have A, B, C, D, E. And each and every answer is a one line explanation that is associated with the disease. Yes, that's a one line association that's associated with the disease. For example, let's say they are talking about a patient who comes to you with stroke, acute uh, ischemic uh, stroke, right? Or acute embolic stroke. And um, over here, they find that in the, in the echocardiogram, there is some sort of a pathway interatrially. Over here in A, B, C, D, they are not going to write patent foramen ovale as, in, as the answer. What they will write is this. They will write a one line explanation of patent foramen ovale. So what they will write is, they will write failure of fusion of, of uh, your failure of fusion of the septum primum plus septum secundum, okay? If they write failure of fusion of septum primum and septum secundum, what does this line indicate? This line indicates which disease? 
Pass answers, please. Hagen, Coromino Valley. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So why do they do this? Why do you assembly step one? Why do they construct questions and construct answers like this? That's because they want to hit three birds with one stone. Okay, what does this mean? This one stone is the question. And the three birds is they want to see whether you understand stroke, whether you understand Peyton Foramino Valley, and whether you understand the pathophysiology of Peyton Foramino Valley. So if you were in charge of constructing the question in this type of a question, could you assess the student's uh, knowledge regarding these three, uh, these three things, yes or no? Yes, okay, as simple as that. Okay, so are we clear everyone, yes or no? Okay, good. So, patent forum in the valley is caused by the failure of septum primum and septum secundum. So this was something that you will see in your answer system that will indicate the disease. This can lead to paradoxical emboli and as can occur in atrial septal defect. So that's that. Yeah. So that's basically what it is. Okay, so just give me one. Okay, so that's it. Now let's move on to the next one over here. So first and foremost, the, the first one that we saw was the, the, the development of the atrium. Now let's talk about the development of the ventricles. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. Now let's talk about the development of the ventricles. Uh, the development of the ventricles, when, when we talk about this, we need to understand that for example, for exactly like the heart, the atriums, the ventricles are also divided into two major chambers. That is the right ventricle and the left ventricle, as simple as that. So what's happening over here is first and foremost, we have the development of the muscular interventricular septum. This is the first thing that develops. Okay, so for example, just as how in the heart, I mean in the atrium, the atrium was one big huge chamber until and unless we had the formation of the ostium primum and then it started dividing. So the ventricles, very similarly to the atriums, they have they initially they have one small division. This small one small division is the division of the muscular interventricular septum. Now, whenever we have a septum, then and only then do we have a foramen. Do, do you guys understand this now? That without a septum, you cannot get a foramen. That is, without an obstruction, you cannot get a pathway. Yes or no? So first and foremost, we have the formation of the muscular interventricular septum. And this interventricular septum, when it forms, then and only then do we have the formation of the foramen. Okay. Now, the next thing what's happening is over here, we have the formation of the aorticopulmonary septum. Now, what is the aorticopulmonary septum? The aorticopulmonary septum is basically this entire portion is divided by a septum like this, okay? This entire, entire portion is divided by a septum like this. This septum, as you can see, will basically rotate like this. This will rotate. And after it rotates, the formation is something like this. Okay. With the two atriums. Okay. So that's that. So the aortical pulmonary septum will basically rotate. And this rotation of the aortical pulmonary septum will close the foramen. And so as you can see, one more time. Uh, over here, give me one second. Okay, so what's happening over here? Look, first and foremost, we have one huge chamber. Okay, then that huge chamber is divided by a, a interventricular foramen, um, um, basically a muscular interventricular septum. 
when it's divided by the interventricular septum, then we have the foramen. This foramen is called interventricular foramen. Right now, we have no division. Then the next step is formation of an aorticopulmonary septum. And this formation of the septum will rotate. When it rotates, then you see that there is basically closure. Now, this is closed. And we have two things over here. First, we have this ball of ventricles. Then we have this portion of the aorticopulmonary septum. So I'm pretty sure you guys can already understand what this portion would, will give rise to. Yes or no? This portion will give rise to the main systemic aorta and the pulmonary are uh, the pulmonary blood vessels. Yes or no? Are we clear? Yes. Okay. So over here, the next the, the next thing is where does this interventricular forum, I mean this interventricular septum, where does this develop from? This inter interventricular septum, this develops from a collection of cells known as endocardial cushions. They will grow from the endocardial cushions. Okay, now, I, now I'll talk about this one more time so that, so that things are clear. So first and foremost, we talked about the atrias. Now we'll talk about the ventricles. Okay, so what's happening is, okay, over here, the atria is already divided. Now this ball is the focus on the ventricle. This is the endocardial cushion. From here, we have the development of fast answers, please. This is called what? This is called the fast answers, please. This is called what? Very good, interventricular septum. Whenever we have the interventricular septum, then we have the interventricular foramen, right? And then what happens in the next step? In the next step, uh, just give me one second. This is, there is an extension, right? If you look something like this. Now, the uh, next step is formation of the The next step is formation of the aortico pulmonary septum. And the aortico pulmonary septum doesn't just form like this, it forms by rotating. Okay, so there are two steps that's happening. First and foremost, aortico pulmonary septum formation. And step two is aortico pulmonary septum rotation. Okay, and after it's done rotating, then we have this entire portion over here, right? This entire portion, but still, isn't there a big hole in the middle still? Yes or no? Isn't there a big hole in the middle still? Yes, okay. This hole is covered up by another membrane. This hole is covered by another membrane. This part is called membranous portion of interventricular septum. And this portion is known as muscular portion of interventricular septum. So the interventricular septum is divided into two portions, membranous and muscular. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Very high yield that we understand that the interventricular septum is formed by the fusion of the membranous portion plus the muscular portion. If we do not get proper fusion, what do we get? Ventricular septal defect. One of the most common defect in, one of the most common defect in a young child. How do we diagnose ventricular septal defect? Ventricular septal defect can occur by itself or it can occur as a part of pathology of the node. Yes? How do we diagnose ventricular septal defect? Ventricular septal defect will be diagnosed by auscultation of a hollow systolic murmur at the mitral region. Hollow systolic murmur at the mitral region will give us a clinical um, idea that the patient might have a ventricular septal defect. And the hollow systolic murmur will be loud a loud, hollow systolic murmur. What is a systolic murmur? I'll talk about this. We basically have two sounds. We have S1, S2, right? S1 is corresponding with the closure of the two valves, that is the mitral and the tricuspid valves. S2 is basically the closure of the two valves, that is the pulmonary and uh, the systemic valves, right? 
So whenever they close together, we get the we get the second heart sound. But whenever the whenever the mitral uh, the mitral the, the tricuspid they close together, we get the first heart sound. Any any sound that happens in between the first and the second heart sound is known as a systolic systolic murmur. Any abnormal heart sound that happens after the closure of the mitral, I mean, after the closure of the pulmonary valves, along with the systemic valves, we call this diastolic murmur. We call this diastolic murmur, right? So in ventricular septal defect, when the heart beats, there will be a systolic murmur. So basically, right after the closure of the, mycosp of the mitral and the tricuspid valve, there will be <laughs> an excessive flow of blood from the right side to the left side in patients of ventricular septal defect. And this will produce the loud hollow systolic murmur that we hear in the left fifth intercostal space in a newborn child. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? Okay, so that's that. We'll talk about ventricular septal defect more in the future, but that's it. This is how we have, um, Okay, one sec. Okay, so please underline this. Most common that can arise because of this. Why do we get this? Ventricular septal defect, failure of fusion of muscular interventricular septum plus membranous interventricular septum. Okay, are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Now, let's talk about the next thing. Um, <clears throat> now, first and foremost, let's talk about the, let's talk about the next thing. Now, let's talk about the outflow tract. So far, what have we discussed? Have we discussed the formation of the, uh, the interatrial uh, septum and the two atrias? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Next thing, what did we talk about? We, we talked about the entire ventricle, the formation of the interventricular septum and the right and left ventricle. Yes or no? The answer is yes. Now the third thing, number three, what will we talk about now? We'll talk about how there is development of the aortico pulmonary tract. Uh, I mean, how there's development of the aortico pulmonary septum. How do we get the formation of the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk? And what are the diseases if there is any problem with this formation of the aortico pulmonary septum? <laughs> now, first and foremost, we have to understand that the aortico pulmonary septum is formed with the migration of the neural crest cells. We'll talk about this in details in embryology, but neural crest cells are a group of highly, highly important cells, which can give rise uh, to the normal, which will give rise to a lot of normal physiologies and the human development. And the neural crest cells are also responsible for the formation of the aortico pulmonary septum. So, the, since neural crest cells are one of the important uh, uh, toshiopotent cells in the body, right? Toshiopotent. Well, what does the word toshiopotent mean? Toshiopotent means that the total potential of giving rise to different sorts of cells in the body, especially we can get the formation of the aortic pulmonary septum. Then neural crest cells are also used for the development of the, uh, of the cells that are responsible for the peristaltic movement and the large intestine. So whenever we get neural crest cell migrations and abnormalities, we can get Hirschsprung disease and many, many other diseases, which we'll talk about later. So basically the neural crest cells are responsible for the formation and the fusion of the aortic pulmonary cell. So the next thing is, if there is any problem with the formation of the neural crest cell or failure of migration of the neural crest cells, will we get the normal formation of the aortic pulmonary septum? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? So if we do not get the formation of the aortic pulmonary septum, do we get the formation of the normal uh, interventricular septum? Yes or no? The answer is yes or no? The answer is no, right? So as a result, we get tetralogy of fallopian. Then do we get the division of the, uh, do we get the division of the outflow tract into ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk? Yes or no? The answer is the answer is no. As a result, we get one large trunk known as truncus arteriosus, right? Another thing is if the aortic pulmonary septum, if it doesn't <laughs> spiral properly or if it doesn't 
rotate properly. Can we get the ascending aorta arising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery arising from the left ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, we can get transposition of great vessels. Thank you. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Are we clear? Okay. Ascending aorta, from where does it arise from? Right ventricle or left ventricle? Ascending aorta. Right ventricle or left ventricle? Very simple question. I expect a very fast answer. Okay. Left or right? Is ascending aorta. Where does it arise from? Right. Left, yes. Okay. Please tell me you guys know this. Okay. I'm sure you guys know this, right? What's happening over here? Right side, left side. Very obvious that the right side will push the blood to the lungs, right? So obviously the lungs, the aorta will not carry the blood to the lungs. So it's a, that's, that's the, that's the uh, pulmonary artery. And so basically, if I say this, then the pulmonary artery is arising from the right side. And the left side will push the blood out into the system circulation through the ascending aorta. What if the ascending aorta arises from the right side and the pulmonary trunk arises from the left side? Will, will, will there be a problem or not? Yes or no? Will, will we have any problems or no problems? Yes, well, we will have a problem, right? Why? Because what's happening? If this is the right side, if this is the left side, the right side is pushing the blood out to the pulmonary uh, trunk. Instead, the right side pushes the blood out to the ascending aorta. So the blood will come back to the right atrium, right? Because Right atrium, right ventricle, right ventricle. If it goes to the ascending aorta, then they will go to the entire body and then they will come back. The left side will push the blood to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, then to the pulmonary trunk, to the lungs, and the lungs will push the blood back into the left side of the heart. So as a result, do we get two separate uh, circulations happening in the body which are not coordinated with one another? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Is, is, is this a possibility of a normal disease? In the, in, in the body, the answer is yes or no? The answer is yes. What do we call this disease? Does anyone know the name of this disease? This is called? Yes, this is called transposition of, thank you so much. This is called transposition of great vessels. Now, uh, very quickly, if we want, these patients to survive. Do you think these patients will, so will survive without intervention? The answer is no. They need to survive. How will they survive this condition? They need to survive this condition because by the possibility that there has to be a connection between the right side and the left side, right? There has to be a connection between the right side of the heart with the left side of the heart. How? Through the ductus arteriosus, right? So number one is medical intervention. Number two is surgical intervention. What is the medical intervention? The medical intervention is to keep the ductus arteriosus patent with the help of what? Can anyone tell me how do we keep it patent for these patients with the help of prostaglandin? Yes. And we give the patients enough time to get ready for the surgery. And then we can have a surgical correction of the two pathways. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So that's it. Now, next one. Let's let's move forward. Let's move forward to the valvular development. Please underline this: aortic and pulmonary valves. They they are arised or they are derived from the endocardial portion of the outflow tract. Very high yield. Underline this. This is a question in your step one exam. Mitral and tricuspid valve, they are developed from the endocardial portion of the atrioventricular canal. So one is developed from the outflow tract endocardial portion, another one is developed from the endocardial portion of the atrioventricular canal. Okay. Now that's that. 
Okay. Whenever we have a valve, the, what are the functions of a valve? Why do we have valves in the human body? Why do we have valves? And why do we have valves in, for example, in the development of a house, right? In plumbing and everything else, we want everything to flow in one direction. So unidirectional, the reason, for example, if this is a pipe, right? And in this pipe, we have valves. What does this mean? We want the blood to flow in only one direction like this. So that when the blood tries to flow back, the valve will close and the blood will move forward. So that's it. So yes, Dr. Tasneem is absolutely correct. We have valves because we want to make sure that blood or any other uh, fluid moves through unidirection. That is one direction, that's it. That's that. So, um, Basically, whenever we have valves, for example, let's talk about the heart, right? So what ha what's happening over here? Um, over here, we have the right side, left side, and that's, that's it. And now over here, we have the valve, something like this. So when the blood flows from the right side, right atrium to the right ventricle, right? I'm pretty sure you guys know this. I'm just repeating normal physiology. The blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle by the contraction of the atrial muscles. And then the right ventricle will contract because of the right ventricular muscles over here. They'll try to push the blood to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs. So isn't there a possibility that if there are no valves, the blood can go back? Yes, and we can have, we can have what? Regurgitation, yes or no? Valvular regurgitation. So to prevent this, what do we need? In a normal physiology, whenever the right ventricle contracts, there's a closure of the, tricuspid uh, valves on the right side, right? And then the valve allows, the, this closure of the tricuspid valve allows the blood to move in one direction. That is on the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs. Yes? Now, th there are a lot of issues that can happen with this process. Number one is while the blood is moving from the right side of the right atrium to the right ventricle, first and foremost, if the valve is stenotic, what does this mean? What does this mean if the valve is stenotic? If the valve is stenotic, will there be easy flow of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle? The answer is no. Okay, as a result, blood will accumulate in the right atrium and push back into the inter, uh, inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, right? So for example, if someone has, if someone has tricuspid stenosis, yes, if someone has tri tricuspid stenosis, then can we have backflow of blood in the, in the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava? The answer is yes. As a result, do we, can we get uh, jugular venous uh, distension? The answer is yes, as simple as that. Another one is um, instead of the tricuspid valve being stenotic, what if the tricuspid valve was regurgitant? What do we mean by this? Regurgitant meaning that, for example, let's say that the tricuspid valve is regurgitant meaning that it's not closing properly, that it's something like this. So when the right ventricle contracts, what will happen? Now the blood can also flow back. The right, there will be backflow and little amount of blood will flow forward as simple as that. So these are basically some things which I need to talk about uh, regarding the valves. Since we are already on this topic, let me just talk about one quick thing over here, which we say as Epstein's anomaly associated with the right side of the heart. Does anyone know the name of a drug that is associated with Epstein's anomaly? Let me give you a hint. This drug is uh, used in uh, bi uh, bipolar disease. It's a mood stabilizer, very good. The name of this drug is lithium, okay? Now, who can explain Epstein's anomaly to me? What is Epstein's anomaly? Who can explain this disease? Please write me in the chat box. That way, if you can talk for one minute, I can rest my voice for one minute. Epstein's anomaly. Who can talk about Epstein's anomaly? Anyone? Anyone? No. What is Epstein's anomaly? Epstein's anomaly is when the right atrium is the valve of the right atrium moves downward. If the valve of the right atrium moves downward, 
right? Or if a, there is a displacement of the valve of the right atrium, but if the tricuspid valve, they're displaced downwards, can we get a big atrium and a small, small ventricle? Yes or no? Yes. As a result, can the atrium look like the ventricle and the ventricle look like the atrium? Because we know atriums are small and ventricles are big. We call this atrialization of ventricle due to valvular displacement, which takes place under the influence of lithium, which is used in bipolar disease. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay, so that's Epstein's anomaly. If they are exceptionally high yield, very, very important for your step one exam. Okay, so that's that. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? No. Let's talk about, let's, let's talk about uh, the, one of the most high yield things that is the derivatives. Now, I wanna talk about um, the process of uh, development. I mean, which primary embryological derivatives gives rise to the atriums, the ventricles, the valves, interventricular septum, and uh, the blood vessels. Okay. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about this. Okay, so first and foremost, I want to talk about <clears throat> I want to talk about this over here very quickly. Now, aortic arch derivatives is something which you can leave. You don't have to read this right now. I'll talk about this later in embryology. Okay, which aortic arch gives rise to which um, artery? I'll talk about this later in embryology. For now, let's move forward to this portion. Now, let's talk about this. What's happening over here? This is basically the process of morphogenesis, that is cardiac morphogenesis, and the process of cardiac looping. As you can see, First and foremost, in a primitive heart, we have basically the formation of a primitive heart tube. When we say that we have the formation of the primitive heart tube, what are some of the structures that gives rise to a primitive heart tube? So the first uh, heart basically comprises of, comprises of four things, okay? This is number one, the blood vessels, Okay, I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible. This is the blood vessel, number one. Number two, we have the formation of a smooth structure called bulbous cordis. Then we have the formation of a not so smooth structure that we call as primitive ventricle. Then we have the formation of another group of blood vessels which we call as cardinal veins. This is the primitive heart tube. So if anyone asks you, what are the portions of a primitive heart tube? What should be your answer? The primitive heart tube is basically formed by the formation of the first aortic arch with the bulbous cordis, bulbous cordis, with the primitive ventricles, with the primitive ventricles, with the cardiac vein. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? Yes, okay. Now what's happening? Now this is morphogenesis or cardiac looping. The, the thing that, that I talked about. So what, ha what happens is um, over here, okay, this is primitive, primitive ventricle, or we can also call this sinus venosus, the same thing, sinus venosus. Now, what's happening is first and foremost, in cardiac looping, the bulbous cordis will move down like this and the sinus venosus or the primitive ventricles will move up like this. As a result, what do we get? As a result, we can get that over here, as you can see, this will be too difficult for me to draw. Let me just show you the picture. As a result, you can see that when the bulbous cord is, this is moving down, 
right? And this sinus venosus, this portion is moving up. And the reason why the bulbous cordis will move down and the sinus venosus, they will move up is because the bulbous cordis is responsible for the formation of the ventricles, right? Especially the smooth part of the left and right ventricles. And the sinus venosus, the sinus venosus, they will basically, they will uh, move up because the sinus venosus are responsible for giving rise to the atriums, right? So as a result, what happens, as you can see, the bubbles cordis will move down, the sinus venosus will move up, and they will assume a position, right, which will keep on moving forward. And at the 15th day, it will look something like this. Okay. So having said this, now let's talk about the embryonic, em, embryological structure. Embryological structures, if we talk about this, first and foremost, we need to understand what are the embryological derivatives, right? The embryological derivatives that we talked about are number one. We talked about um, the aortic arches, the four things. Can anyone remember the four things I said? Aortic arches. The next one is bulbous cordis, then sinus venosus, and cardinal veins. Are we clear? Yes or no? These are the four structures that are responsible for forming the, for forming the primary heart tube. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind the heart chambers, okay? The heart chambers, they have two portions. One is a smooth portion, Another one is a rough portion, or we call this trabeculated portion. What or what factor or which factor decides which chamber of the heart is smooth or which chamber of the heart is rough? The factor that decides the smoothness or the roughness of the heart chamber is the blood flow. If blood flows smoothly through, through one portion of the heart, it gives rise to a smooth portion. Are we clear, yes or no? If blood does not flow smoothly and it flows in a turbulent manner in a portion of the heart, we call this trabeculated. We call this trabeculated portion. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. Do we have Dr. Maza Ahmed with us today? Dr. Maza, yes or no? Let me just see one second. Oh, you, oh, you're here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank God, because I thought that you paid for the transaction and you did not receive the link. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, that's that. All right, the smooth and rough. Okay, now let's talk about this. Are we understanding the lecture? Yes or no? Everyone? Yes? Okay. If you don't worry, we'll do a quick revision and recapitulation of the entire topic. So that's that. Now, first and foremost, let's talk about the atrium. Now, how many portions does the atrium have in so in terms of human in terms of development? Fast answers, please. Two. What are the two portions? What are the two portions of the atrium? One is one is smooth, another one is rough. As simple as that, right? Do you guys understand this? No. So doesn't this mean that the smooth portion will develop from one side and the rough portion will develop from the, and another structure? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes. So atrium. Atrium is then again divided into two. Right, left, right atrium, smooth part. Where is it developed from? The smooth part of the right atrium is developed from the sinus venosus. Are we clear? Now, obviously, if it's the sinus venosus, then which part of the sinus venosus? Left side or right side? Right side of the sinus venosus. Are we clear? rough part 
part, the traffic related part. Where is it developed from? It's developed from a portion of the embryonic structure, which we call this as primitive atrium. Primitive atrium is the first portion of the atria that receives the turbulent blood flow, or the basically the first portion of the atrium that receives the blood that gives rise to the rough structure. That's why we call this primitive atrium. So the right atrium has the smooth part developed from the right horn of sinus venosus and the rough part developed from the primitive atrium. Are we clear? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Yes. Okay. Next one is left atrium. Left atrium, smooth part. Where is it developed from? Smooth part of the left atrium is basically developed from an extension of the primitive pulmonary vein. It's developed from the extension of the primitive pulmonary vein. Basically what's happening, if this is the right side, the left side, right? The left side is, the, the left atrium is receiving blood or will receive blood in the future when the baby develops from the, primitive, from the pulmonary vein. So one portion is, the, so the smooth portion of this side is uh, developing from the sinus venosus and the smooth portion of this side is basically developed from the primitive pulmonary vein, the extension of the primitive pulmonary vein that gives rise to the smooth portion of the left atrium. Are we clear? Next one is the rough side or the, or the rough portion of the left atrium. Where is the rough, rough portion developed from? Rough, the rough portion is also developed from, can, I, can anyone answer the question? This is from primitive atrium. Are we clear, yes or no? Primitive atrium. Okay. So quick question, atrial development. Who can tell me the atrial development? Fast answers, please. Right side, left side. Right atrium, smooth part, developed from. Fast answers, please. Right atrium, smooth side, developed from. Sinus venosus, fast answers. Uh, right atrium, trabeculated side, is developed from. Primitive atrium, very good. Left atrium, smooth side, developed from. Primitive pulmonary vein, right? Uh, left atrium, uh, trabeculated part, is, is, is developed from. Primitive atrium, are we clear? Yes, okay, good. Next one, ventricles. Ventricles, okay. So right ventricle and left ventricle. Right ventricle, once again, smooth part and rough part. So right side smooth, right ventricle, left ventricle. Smooth part, develop from, can anyone tell me the answer? BC, that is bulbous cordis. So smooth part, both, both of them or only one of them? The answer is both of them. Bulbous cordis. Okay. Next one, rough part of the trabeculated part. So left vent, uh, the right ventricle, rough part. Can anyone tell me where it's developed from? Very simple. This is called? Primitive ventricle. What is primitive ventricle? Once again, how the rough part of the right atrium was developed from where? The rough part of the right atrium was developed from the primitive atrium. The rough part of the left atrium was developed from the primitive atrium two. And once again, what is the primitive atrium that gives rise to the two rough parts of the right and left atrium? This is the first portion of the heart that, is that I mean, this is the first portion of the atrium that receives the turbulent blood flow. As a result, it becomes rough and uh, it, 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 it's known as the primitive atrium. Just think about this for one quick second. In a, in a baby with a developing heart, the membrane, is it is it weak? Or it, I sort of, for example, I, I sort of imagine the membrane of the atriums of the babies to be jelly-like, okay? This is just an imagination. Now, when I imagine that the atriums of the babies are jelly-like, and this jelly is basically getting hit very hard, with turbulent blood. Can we get uneven portions of the jelly? Yes or no, smooth or rough, I mean, I mean, like uneven rough portion? Yes, okay. So this is sort of an explanation to what happens in the trabeculated part. So for example, if you think of a developing human, obviously their membranes are not very strong, they're weak and jelly-like. 
this allows them to get hit very hard by the turbulent blood flow that takes away small portions of the um, membrane resulting in this primitive structure. So primitive atrium and primitive ventricle. <clears throat> so it's very simple to understand that whenever we talk about rough portion of the atria and rough portion of the ventricles, these are basically those structures that were hit hard by the turbulent blood flow, giving rise to the rough segments. The smooth parts, they have their own development, but all the rough segments, rough uh, the, right, the, the rough portions of the atrias and the rough portions of the ventricles are all developed from the primitive atrium and the primitive ventricle. So this goes without saying that the rough portion of the right ventricle is from the primitive ventricle. The rough portion of the left ventricle is also from the, fast answer please, it's also from the primitive ventricle. Okay, so we're done with the atriums and they we're done with the ventricles. What else do we have? Okay, let's talk about the blood vessels. Whenever we talk about this, let's talk about the major blood vessels. Uh, the major blood vessels are what? Aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And we all know where it develops from. It, it develops from after the, the truncus arteriosus is divided properly by the aortic pulmonary septum and it fuses and rotates, it forms into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So both of them are have a they both of them have, have one very solid source of development, that is the truncus arteriosus. What would happen if the aortic if the aortic pulmonary septum if it doesn't uh, form or fuse properly? Can we get persistent truncus arteriosus? Yes or no? No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's talk some. Uh, let's talk about some other blood vessels. <clears throat> what are some other important blood vessels? We have one that is superior vena cava, and we have another one that is inferior vena cava. Where does the superior vena cava develop from? Now this is extremely high yield for step one. Superior vena cava development is very widely asked, so you have to remember this. Do you guys remember we talked about the fact that the primary heart tube has what? Aortic arch, bulbous cordis, sinus venosus, and cardinal vein. Yes, do you guys remember the four structures? Yes. So this cardinal vein, this cardinal vein, this is responsible for giving rise to the superior and inferior vena cava. Now the, the cardinal vein has right side, left side, anterior side, posterior side. So the superior vena cava is developed from the right common cardinal and right anterior cardinal, okay? So right common cardinal and right anterior cardinal. The inferior vena cava is developed from the posterior cardinal, subcardinal, and supracardinal. Okay. Are we clear? Inferior vena cable development is also very, very important. Are we clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> okay. Next one. What else do we have? So we're done talking about the blood vessels. We're done talking about the chambers. Now let's start, let's start talking about the valves. Okay, where do we have the development of the um, atrioventricular valves, semilunar valves, and the septums? Do you guys remember that I talked about the fact that the interventricular septum, where does it develop from interventricular septum? The muscular portion, it has one common source, very good, EC, that EC stands for endocardial cushion. Okay, so the endocardial cushion, what is it giving rise to? First and foremost, it's giving rise to the interventricular septum, especially the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. It also gives rise to the interatrial septum and the valves. Which valves? Atrioventricular and semilunar valves. Okay. Basically, most all the valves, more or less, all the valves that develop from the Endocardial cushion. So if we have any problem with this endocardial cushion, do we have the formation of atrioventricular septal defect? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Can anyone tell me one chromosomal abnormality where we can get uh, endocardial cushion defect? As a result, patients will inevitably get atrioventricular septal defect. 
uh, it's a chromosomal abnormality and it's a very common chromosomal abnormality. This is, okay, down, okay. What do we mean by down? Down syndrome, very good. Or trisomy 21. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay, now. <clears throat> Okay. Is everyone paying attention in the lecture? Yes or no? Okay. If you guys are paying attention in the lecture, then you should be able to tell me the answers of these things right now. Okay, first, first one. Number one, <clears throat> smooth right atrium. Where is it developed from? Fast answers. Smooth right atrium. Where is it developed from? Sinus venosus, right horn or sinus venosus. Very good. Next one, trabeculated right atrium. Where is it developed from? Primitive atria. Next one, smooth left atria. Where is it developed from? Primitive pulmonary vein. Very good. Trabeculated left atrium. Where is it developed from? Trabeculated primitive atria. Very good. Smooth right ventricle. Where is it developed from? Bulbous cordis. Trabeculated right ventricle. Where is it developed from? Primitive ventricle. Next one. Smooth left ventricle. Where is it developed from? Bulbous cordis. Next one. Trabeculated left ventricle. Where is it developed from? Primitive ventricle. Okay. Next one. Ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. Where is it developed from? Truncus arteriosus. Very good. Superior vena cava. Where is it developed from? Right common cardinal and right anterior cardinal. Next one. Inferior vena cava. Where is it developed from? Posterior subcardinal supracardinal means back, down, and up. Posterior, subcardinal, supracardinal vein. Okay, next one, what are we missing out? All the septums and valves, where is it developed from? Endocardial cushion. Okay. Are we clear everyone, yes or no? <clears throat> this is the development of the heart. Okay, are we confident about this? Yes or no? From over here, you will 100% receive questions regarding superior vena cava. You will 100% receive questions regarding inferior vena cava. Uh, ascending order and pulmonary trunk, very important. Bulbous cord is important. Okay. There's another one called coronary sinus. Coronary sinus, they're, they're important because they give rise to different sorts of coronary arteries, right? Where do we have the development of the coronary sinus? It's not very really high yield, but do you guys remember I said that the sinus venosa's right horn is responsible for the smooth part of the right atrium. So if I say that there's a right horn, obviously there should also be a left horn. So the left horn is basically for coronary sinus. If you want to remember this, but if you do not remember this, that's not a problem. It's not very widely asked. Okay, are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay. Let's move forward. Okay. So that's it. Now let's talk about the fetal cell circulation. Okay. Uh, in the fetal circulation, do we have the normal development of the lungs? Yes or no? The answer is the lungs are developed, but do they allow the flow of blood? Yes or no? The answer is they do not allow the flow of blood. So what's happening in the fetal circulation, as you can see, obviously we know that the fetus will get all its blood supply from the mother through the placenta. So the, in the placenta, what's happening is you can see that the umbilical vein is carrying the oxygenated blood and the arteries are carrying the deoxygenated blood. So what's happening, let's see. From the placenta, we see that the umbilical vein is carrying the oxy oxygenated blood all the way through this, right? And it bypasses the liver, that is it goes through the liver right through the liver. As you can see, a little amount of blood is going through the portal vein and a little amount of blood is bypassing the liver through this thing called ductus venosus, right? 
ductus venosus is basically the duct or the blood vessel that allows the umbilical vein to bypass the liver <clears throat> and go to the uh, right atrium, right? So basically it goes through the liver to the ductus venosus, it goes to the right atrium. What happens in the right atrium? Look, in the right atrium, at first the blood tries to flow in the normal direction from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Then from the right ventricle, it tries to go to the pulmonary circulation, but it can't, right? Because the pulmonary circulation is basically blocked off because the lungs are not functioning properly. The vessels are vasoconstricted and collapsed. So it cannot go to the lungs. So where will it go? Where it will go is that it has a connection. As you can see, the pulmonary trunk has a connection with the systemic trunk or the truncus arteriosus through another duct. We call this ductus arteriosus. This allows blood to go and this, this blood, when it goes over here, it goes through all the different portions of the body, for example, of the baby's organs, right? And in the baby's organs, those blood, they are, I mean, they use the oxygen in the oxygenated blood and they give off carbon dioxide, giving rise to the deoxygenated blood. And as a result, the blood comes back and you see that the blood has turned blue, which shows that all the oxygen has been used up and the carbon dioxide has been released as a result of the blue color. And while this also happens, a little portion or a portion of the blood flows to the right atrium, to the left atrium, to the foramen ovale. And from the left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle and it also follows the same pathway over here, okay? And then <clears throat> this deoxygenated blood will be carried all the way down through the internal iliac arteries, they'll go to the legs and everything else. They'll take the blood all the way up from the lower limb. Then they will give it back to the placenta through the umbilical arteries to the mother's circulation so that the mother's lungs can expel the excess carbon dioxide and then give again the oxygenated blood through the umbilical vein. So, so once again, first and foremost, the baby's lungs are not functioning properly so they cannot get rid of the carbon dioxide and they cannot get oxygen. So they have to rely on the placenta. So one more time, what's happening? The mother's blood vessel, the umbilical vein will carry the blood. They will bypass the liver through the ductus arteriosus, into the inferior vena cava, go to the right atrium. From the right atrium, they'll go to the right ventricle. And also from the right atrium, they'll go to the left atrium, to the foramen ovale. Then they will enter the systemic circulation, go to different portions of the body. And also the blood from over here will go to the systemic circulation through ductus arteriosus, use the oxygen, get rid of the, I mean, use the oxygen and release carbon dioxide, resulting in deoxygenated blood, which will be released back into the umbilical arteries because the baby's lungs cannot get rid of the carbon dioxide because it's obviously it's not functioning. So the umbilical arteries will carry the deoxygenated blood through the placenta to the mother and the mother will have to use her own lungs to, of course, get rid of the carbon dioxide. So let's read the text over here very quickly. Blood in the umbilical vein has a partial pressure of oxygen of 30 millimeters of mercury and is 80% saturated with oxygen, not high yield. Don't worry about this. Umbilical arteries have low oxygen saturation. Please underline this. This is a question. Okay. And obviously it makes sense because the umbilical arteries are responsible for taking the blood back to the mother. So that's that. There are three important shunts in the fetus. We have to know of all of these shunts. Number one, is obviously the ductus venosus that will bypass the liver to enter into the inferior vena cava. The second one is the foramen ovale that will bypass the atrium. And the third one is the ductus arteriosus that will bypass, um, basically, uh, it will allow the blood to, to, to flow from the pulmonary trunk to the system of circulation, that's that. Ductus arteriosus is very important because it, uh, in some patients who have uh, cyanotic heart diseases, we can use ductus venosus and allow the blood to flow from the right side to the left side. There are a lot of diseases where the blood cannot flow from the right side to the left side. And in those patients, we need to keep the ductus arteriosus open until and unless the patient is ready for surgery. So that's that. And prostaglandin is responsible for keeping the duct patent. Okay. Now, what happens at birth? At birth, whenever the infant, you guys remember I talked about this at the beginning of the lecture, yes or no? You guys remember that at birth, what happens? The first thing the baby does is cry. When the baby cries, the baby takes a breath. Whenever the baby takes a breath, the lungs expand. When the lungs expand, right? For example, this is the baby's lungs before the baby cries. Now, when the baby cries, the lungs expand and <clears throat> get bigger, right? So if the lungs get bigger, the blood vessels, do they also get bigger with the lungs? 
I mean, do they also dilate with the lungs? Yeah, yes or no? The answer is yes. If the blood vessels dilate, what would happen to the vascular resistance? Will it increase or will it decrease? Obviously, it will decrease, right? If they dilate, they will decrease. If they decrease, will they allow more blood to flow or less blood to flow? The answer is they'll, they'll allow more blood to flow. So this increase in left atrium, so as a result, if more blood flows, now will more blood come back to the left atrium, to the lungs once the baby breathes, yes or no? The answer is yes. This excessive blood that comes into the left atrium, can it close the foramen ovale by pushing on the septum? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So increased left atrial pressure will close the foramen ovale. And now this is called fossa ovalis, as simple as that. Okay. And after birth, when the baby cries, right, the prostaglandin secretion also decreases. And this decrease of prostaglandin will close the foramen ovale. So, I mean, will close the ductus arteriosus. My apologies. They will close the ductus arteriosus. As simple as that. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Let me, let me explain this one more time, then I'll move forward. Okay, what's happening? Because a lot of you are not saying yes, so that's a bit worrisome. Okay, <clears throat> this is the baby's heart. This is the baby's lungs. After birth, the baby cries, the lungs expand. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. We do not have a lot of time. Yes, they expand. As a result, there is dilatations of the blood vessels, right? So the resistance will increase or decrease. The answer is the, the, the resistance will increase. Now blood can easily flow from the right ventricle to the lungs, yes or no? The answer is yes. If more blood flows to the lungs, can, will more blood come back to the lung, uh, to the heart, yes or no, to the left atrium? The answer is yes. If more blood comes to the left atrium after the, lung, after the lungs expand, will it close the foramen ovale? The answer is yes. As a result, what is this called? This is called fossa ovalis, as simple as that. And after birth, what, have, what would happen to the level of prostaglandin? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be low. If it, if it falls, will, it, will we have closure of the ductus arteriosus? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Did everyone understand this? Very simple. Okay, next one. Okay, next one. Next one is fetal postnatal derivatives, right? Uh, ductus venosus will close and will get something called ligamentum venosum. Uh, in anatomy, do you guys remember in anatomy, we had to explain the liver in its anatomical, in its, um, anatomical position? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Whenever we talked about the liver, we had to explain what the little <clears throat> ligament was right, on the medial surface of the liver. Do you guys remember that little ligament? A very famous questions that uh, this ligament represents what? This ligament is known as ligamentum venosum. This represents ductus venosus, ligamentum venosum. Ligamentum arteriosum is another one that represents ductus arteriosus, right? Fossa ovalis in the heart, in the interatrial septum. The atrial septum has something like this. This is a fossa. This fossa represents Foramen ovale. I think you guys all know this. Then there's another thing called allantoa. Allantoa is basically the connection between the umbilicus and the bladder. For example, the babies do they do they urinate through the uh, reproductive organs or do they urinate through the umbilicus? The answer is babies urinate uh, when I mean not 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 babies. Basically, fetuses. Fetuses they urinate through the umbilicus, right? Through a connection called the allantoa, right? If uh, the allen persists, then we can get a lot of problems, which we will talk about in the GI tract, but usually the allen will degenerate and the remnant of the allen will give rise as the median umbilical ligament, okay? Umbilical arteries will be the, the medial umbilical ligament and the umbilical vein will be the ligament of the hepatics, also seen in the liver, okay? Over here, which ones are high yield? This one, uh, this one, this one, and this one. Okay. Alan Tua, ductus venosus, umbilical artery, umbilical vein. 
Are we clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So with that being said, congratulations. We are done with cardiovascular embryology. Did we understand the embryology? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Let me see how much you guys understood this. Just give me two minutes. Let me ask you a couple of questions and we'll take a short break. Then we'll move to cardiovascular anatomy. Okay. Now, before I ask you the questions, can I give you guys five minutes to go through the cardiovascular embryology? Yes or no? Five quick sec, five quick minutes. Just go through the text very quickly. Just go through this text. Just move your eyes through the text over here for five minutes. I'll ask you questions. Then I'll move forward to an editor. Okay. Okay, is everyone ready, yes or no? <clears throat> okay. okay. Um, first question, heart develops at which week? Heart develops from ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm? Mesoderm. If there's a patient with a cardiovascular problem at a, from a very young age, uh, what are some of the other problems which we would also like to see if the patient has or not? That's answer, please. Do you guys remember bacterial defects? Yes. Bacterial defects. Okay. So Rumi ask you the question one more time. If the patient, if the baby has a heart problem from a very young age, what are some other problems the baby can have? That's answer, please. Bacterial problems. If the heart is on the right side and not on the left side, what do we call this, this disease? Cardiogenic syndrome. Very good. And your homework is to study or watch a video on cardiogenic syndrome and cystic fibrosis from YouTube, not from first aid, from YouTube. Next one heart formation. Uh, if there is a development of a paradoxical emboli, this is due to the pathology of what? That's answer, please. Patient for Amino Valley. Okay. Next one is the interventricular the interventricular septum has two portions. What are the names of those portions? Membranous and muscular. Very good. Um, the aortic pulmonary septum will they divide the truncus arteriosus in two portions. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. What are the names of those two portions? Uh, now that the thing is. If the aortical pulmonary septum fails to form the portions, what do we get? Very good. Now, the aortical pulmonary septum is, is derived from which group of cells? Last answer, please. 
Very good. Neural crest cells. Okay, very good. Uh, if a patient is, uh, if, if the mother is taking uh, lithium during pregnancy, the baby can have a disease known as? Epstein's anomaly. Very good. Uh, the superior vena cava is developed from which embryonic, uh, which embryonic structure? The superior vena cava is developed from the very good, right common cardinal and right anterior cardinal. Very good. Um, next one. The smooth parts of the left and right ventricle is developed from. Bulbous cordis, very good. The smooth part of the right atrium is developed from? Sinus venosis. The smooth part of the left atrium is developed from? Primitive pulmonary vein, okay. Um, next one is uh, the rough portions of the two atria are developed from? Very good. Primitive atria. The rough portions of the two ventricles, they are, they are developed from primitive vein. Very good. Um, next one is the valves and the interatrial septum. They are developed from very good. Okay. Uh, what else? What else? What else did we have? Valves, chambers. Uh, oh, uh, the aortic. Are, um, the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk, they are developed from. <clears throat> trunk is articulated, very good. Inferior vena cava is developed from. Inferior vena cava is developed from. Okay, very good. What else do we have? I think that's about it, right? Um, very good. Posterior subcardinal and supercardinal. Okay. What do we? What else do we have? What? What other questions do we have? Uh, umbilical arteries or umbilical vein? Which one has lower oxygen saturation? Arteries. Very good. What are? How many shunts does the fetal circulation have? Three. Uh, very good. Three shunts will close. First, first and foremost, the ductus arteriosus will close under the influence of absence or presence of prostaglandin. Absence of prostaglandin. Yes or no? <coughs> Very good. The foramen ovale will close under the influence of high left atrial pressure or low left atrial pressure. Okay. Uh, let me ask you guys something. If the baby does not tie properly or if the lungs do not expand properly, will we have a lot of blood going to the right ventricle to the lung? Yes or no? No. If a lot of blood doesn't go to their lungs, will a lot of blood come back to the left atrium? Yes or no? No. If a lot of blood, if there is not a lot of blood that comes back to the left atrium, will we have proper closure of the coronal valley? Yes or no? So is it important for the baby to cry as loud as possible during birth, yes or no? Yes, okay, are we clear? No. So do you realize why uh, physicians, they freak out when babies are not crying? Because this can give rise to multiple problems. Yes? For example, right when a baby is delivered, we need to make sure that the baby cries. So we put the baby upside down and then we smack the baby in the buttocks, right? To make sure that the baby cries as much as possible, okay? Uh, what else do we get? What else do we have? Uh, if you want to keep the ductus arteriosus open, what are you going to give? Prostaglandin or no prostaglandin? Prostaglandin. If you want to close the ductus arteriosus, will you give prostaglandin or uh, NSAID? NSAID. Okay. Okay. Um, now, next question. Next question is that the umbilical artery will give rise to which one? Postnatal derivative, median or medial umbilical ligament? Medial, very good. Allentois will give, will give rise to median or medial? Allentois. 
medium. Very good. Okay. I think you guys have um, grasped the concept of cardiovascular embryology. Yes or no? Is everyone confident about cardiovascular embryology? Okay, good. Okay, is everyone happy with what they have learned? And how do you know you're happy if you know that you don't have any confusion? If you don't have any, any confusion, then you should be happy. If you have any confusion, then you should let me know right now before after. So after this, I'll move on to cardiovascular anatomy. Does anyone have any questions for me from cardiovascular anatomy, which they did not understand or they need me to repeat? Okay, Dr. Ellen's a thumbs up, Dr. S is a no. How about the rest of the students? Dr. Nazareth is a no, very good. Dr. Nazareth, uh, Dr. Jordan is your immediate sibling or your cousin? Immediate sibling, okay. So very good, so both of you guys, two sisters, Sitting for the USM lead exam, very good, okay. Great, okay, who else? Dr. Noon Mohammed is a no, Dr. Nafi Sahar is a no. Who else is a no so that I know that everyone has understood? Can I please get a no from everyone if you do not need me to explain anything else? I need to make sure each and every one of you have understood this. Dr. Nicole is a no, meaning she has understood. Dr. V is a no, Dr. Ahmed is a no, meaning she has understood. How about the rest of the students? Okay, uh, now, <clears throat> okay, Dr. Tasneem Zeno, thank you so much. Now, to all the students who are listening to the recording, Dr. Jorge Zeno, thank you so much. To all the students who are listening to the recording, please try to make sure, if possible, make sure that you can come to at least one class because the students who are only present in the class can say yes or no, and I can repeat myself. But to all the students who are listening to the recording, if you guys have any confusion, then I'm not being able to understand whether you completely understood this or not. So I'm not being able to make sure. So please try to make sure that you at least come to one class to get rid of your confusion. This could be any class whatsoever. Okay, so if you're listening to the recording, we have just finished cardiovascular embryology. <clears throat> and if you have any confusions or questions, either send us an email or please come to one of our lectures so that we can explain the process because this is extremely, extremely high yield. Okay. So with that being said, thank you so much. Can we take a quick uh, 10 to 15 minute break and then let's come back and finish anatomy and start with cardiovascular physiology. So we'll finish cardiac anatomy. We'll start with cardiovascular physiology and eventually we'll move forward. And our goal is to finish cardiovascular system in one week. I'm not sure how possible that will be, but I'll try my best and see how we do. Okay, so let's take a break for 15 minutes. It's 11.45 as of right now. Let's take a break to 12. And let's come back. Okay. Thank you so much.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Or something? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? <coughs> yes, that'd be good. So are we ready to begin uh, the discussion on cardiovascular anatomy and physiology? First and foremost, please write this small mnemonic um, over here so that you remember a very high yield information and you can answer a very high yield question. Write this down, L-A-P-R-V-A. -A. What does this mean? An anatomy of the heart. A very high yield question is going to be asked regarding the positions of the left atrium and the right ventricle. Number one, LAP stands for left atria is <clears throat> posterior. Left atria is posterior. RVA stands for right ventricle is anterior. So what does this mean? If someone is stabbed, for example, in a traumatic stabbing of the thoracic cavity, if someone is stabbed anteriorly through here with a knife, right? The question is which portion or which chamber of the heart is going to get penetrated first? The answer is right ventricle, extremely high yield, okay? So that's it. Now, another one is the left atrium is the most posterior portion of the heart. So doesn't this mean that in the mediastinum, <clears throat> especially in the middle mediastinum, we have the heart and its great vessels along with the esophagus, is or no? The answer is yes. So over here, if the left atrium is the most posterior portion of the heart, so if this is the esophagus, then over here you have the heart, right? So if this left atrium is the most posterior portion of the heart, if it gets bigger, can it compress the esophagus? The answer is yes. Now, when will the left atrium get big? For example, this is the right, this is the left. If there is a severe mitral stenosis, will the left atrium push more trying to get the blood out of this chamber? The answer is Yes. If the, left ventri if the left atrium pushes more, does it push with the muscle? The answer is yes. If the muscles work hard, will they undergo hypertrophy? The answer is yes. As a result, will the left atrium get big? The answer is yes. When it does, will it compress on the esophagus? The answer is yes. So as a result, can patients get difficulty in swallowing or dysphagia? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's it. Are we clear? So if there's a patient who comes to you with the constellation of sign symptoms of recent onset of dysphagia, which has a gradual onset for the last couple of weeks, along with that, the patient also has a diastolic murmur. What is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is mitostenosis. Okay. And this dysphagia that is caused by the compression of the left atria, this is called Ortner syndrome. So what is Ortner syndrome? Ortner syndrome is basically a disease where we have dysphagia or compression of the esophagus <clears throat> by the bulging portion of the left atrium. <clears throat> okay, so that's it. So when they bulge into the left atrium, not only can they compress the esophagus, they can also compress the recurrent laryngeal nerve. As a result, patients can get hoarseness of the voice and they can also push on the vagus nerve and that's that. Okay, so what are the questions which you will get from over here? Number one, if someone is stabbed anteriorly, which portion of the heart is damaged? The answer is right ventricle. Which portion of the heart is posterior? The answer is left atrium. <clears throat> what would happen if there's a mitostenosis? There will be left atrial enlargement. As a result, what are the structures that will get compressed? The answer is esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, and vagus nerve. What is the name of the syndrome of esophageal compression under the influence of left atrial enlargement? 
The answer is Ortner syndrome. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one. Pericardium. What is a pericardium? Pericardium is basically the external uh, protective layer of the heart. Yes or no? So we have a couple of layers of the pericardium. I'm pretty sure you guys know all of this. First and foremost, if this is the heart, right? The pericardium that will surround the heart, this pericardium is known as a visceral pericardium. And then there's another layer outside. This is the fibrous pericardium. And the one in the middle, and the one in between the fibrous pericardium and the epicardium is called the parietal pericardium. That's as simple as that. Uh, the pericardial space is very important because it lies between the parietal pericardium and the epicardium, meaning the visceral pericardium. Why is this pericardial space? Why is this important? This pericardial space is this important because it allows the heart to beat properly. Uh, and it allows the heart to expand in terms of the fact that whenever we have accumulation of the blood, we do not want the heart to be stiff. We want the heart to have sufficient space surrounding the heart so that in terms of any uh, reason for which there could be increased blood volume for which the heart needs to expand, it can. Okay, But let's talk about what would happen if there is fluid in the pericardial space. If there is fluid, um, if there is fluid from the pericardial space or in the pericardial space, space, can the heart can the heart expand? Yes or no? Okay, can the heart expand? No. Okay. Oh, so if the heart cannot expand in the uh, if there is fluid in the pericardial space, then let me explain one thing very clearly. For example, there is a lot of fluid in the pericardial space. So as a result, you're telling me that the heart can expand. Very good. So will we have backflow of blood if the right ventricle cannot contract properly because of the high amount of fluid in the pericardial space? The answer is yes or no. As a result, do we get jugular venous distension? The answer is yes. Next one is will the blood contract or can the heart contract with a lot of pressure? to push the blood out, yes or no? The answer is no, right? So do we get hypotension or hypertension? Do we get hypotension or hypertension? We get hypotension. Another one is if someone is, if there's a physician who's trying to hear or auscultate the sounds of a heart, can they hear the sound properly or do they, will they have problem hearing the sound because of all the liquid? They will hear muffled heart sound, right? They will hear muffled heart sound. These three things, when combined together, jugular venous distension because of the fluid surrounding the heart, blood cannot come properly because uh, the heart cannot contract and there will be backflow of blood. This is called jugular venous distension loss of blood or accumulation of blood in the pericardial space, along with the fact that the heart cannot push the blood appropriately will lead to hyper hypotension. All the fluid around the pericardial space, when you try to auscultate, this will result in a muffled heart sound. All of these three things causes what? This is known as, this, does anyone know about this thing? This is called Bex, very good, Bex triad. Bex triad, well, whenever we hear or we have these three things together, jugular venous distension, hypotension, and muffled heart sound. All of these things accumulate pericardial effusion. Yes or no? Either due to trauma, either due to rupture of a ventricular wall, right? Either due to aspiration or anything else, but this indicates pericardial effusion. Let's talk about another pathology. If we have a patient who has a sudden onset of chest pain, and the chest pain is um, decreased when the patient sits up and leans forward, and you hear a friction rub or a scratchy heart sound when you try to auscultate. What is your provisional diagnosis? Your provisional diagnosis is acute pericarditis. 
When does this happen? Acute pericarditis, the most common cause of acute pericarditis is an underlying previous viral infection. It just could be a viral upper respiratory tract infection <clears throat> or anything else. Uh, we have a lot of different types of viruses that can cause pericarditis, out of which some important viruses, for example, Coxsackie virus can cause this. Right Nowadays, we're also hearing that uh, coronavirus causes a little bit of myocarditis, not pericarditis, but then again, some cases have also shown to cause pericarditis. That's that. But what else do we get? Another reason why patients can develop acute pericarditis is as a complication of what? As a complication of myocardial infarction. Yes or no? No, that's that. These are some of the pathologies. We'll talk about the, we'll talk about these details. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. Question: Why don't the heart increase pressure to pump? How can the heart increase the pressure to pump the blood? In order for the heart to increase the pressure, it needs space around its uh, its organ. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. For example, let me tell you. Okay. Now, let me tell you. For example, well, who asked the question? The question was from Dr. Nazar. Okay. So, Dr. Nazar, let me get your attention over here very quickly. Let's say this is you. Okay. <laughs> this is you. These are your hands. These are your feet. You want to push someone. Let's say you want to push Dr. Jordan. Okay. For whatever reason. Okay, let's say you want to push Dr. Jordan, and this is this is you. Uh, now, if you have space over here, for example, if the wall is over here, right? Can you use your legs to push forward to push Dr. Jordan? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. What if you did not have space? What if the wall was over here? Then can you push more or push less? The thing is, if the wall is over here, then you do not have enough space in the back to contract your muscles or go back and you cannot push her effectively, right? So that's basically the reason. So in order for anything to contract, it needs the space. So in terms of a pericardial effusion, there is no space as a result, the pressure is less, okay? Now let's talk about this. There are three layers of the fibrous pericardium. I mean, there's three layers of the pericardium from uh, outer to inner. We have fibrous parietal epicardium. <clears throat> the pericardial space is between uh, the parietal and the epicardium. It's not between fibrous and parietal. It's between parietal and epicardium. Please underline this with your blue pen. Parietal and epicardium. Pericardium innervation is by the phrenic nerve. Please underline this. Phrenic nerve innervation by Aphrodic nerve innervation to the pericardium. Pericarditis can cause referred pain to the neck as a because of the same innervation of C345, that is the phrenic nerve. So that's that. So patients can get uh, referred pain <clears throat> in the neck or one or both shoulders, especially if on the left side, because the heart is on the left side. So the heart is innervated more, the pericardium by the left phrenic nerve. So the referred pain will be on the left side. Okay. So that's that. So next time you get a patient who comes to you with a scratchy heart sound, um, <clears throat> Acute onset of chest pain, mild fever, shoulder, uh, shoulder pain on the left side. What is your provisional diagnosis? Acute pericarditis. Okay, next one, coronary blood supply. Coronary blood supply is basically over here what's happening. The ascending aorta is divided into uh, different sorts of arteries on the, by, on the basis of coronary sinuses. Coronary sinuses will basically uh, divide the ascending aorta into some branches. These branches are known as the coronary artery branches. The most important artery is left anterior descending artery, right? The left anterior descending artery will supply the anterior two third of the interventricular septum and anterior lateral papillary muscle and anterior surface of the left ventricle. The more, the, the easiest way you can remember this is for example, let's say this, this box, there's a box, right? Okay, let's say there's a box. This box is your, box for left ventricle. This is the medial side of the box. This is the lateral side of the box. This is the interventricular septum. Okay, this is the entire left ventricle, left ventricle. Now, the left anterior descending artery will supply the anterior two-third of the interventricular septum, meaning that it will start its supply from over here, anterior two-third 
And then not only will it supply the anterior two third, it will also supply the anterior surface of the left ventricle. So this is by left anterior descending artery. <clears throat> now, the, the posterior descending artery, right? The posterior descending artery will start its supply from here. That is the posterior one third, and it will supply the posterior two third up to here of the posterior portion of the left ventricle. This is by the posterior descending artery. The rest from over here to over here will be supplied by what? Can anyone tell me which artery will supply from here to here? This is by left circumflex. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. So, anterior two third of the interventricular septum and the anterior surface of the left ventricle is by left anterior descending, posterior one third and the posterior two third of the left ventricle is supplied by the posterior descending artery. And uh, the rest is supplied by left circumflex artery, that's that. Now let's talk about another thing over here. Let's talk about some questions. First of all, keep in mind that the left anterior descending artery will supply the anterolateral papillary muscles. Okay, so that's it. So uh, is there a possibility that if we have occlusion of the left anterior descending artery, there can be weakness of the anterolateral papillary muscle? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So what would happen if we have weakness of the anterolateral papillary muscle? For example, can we get valvular regurgitations? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. Next one is that uh, the posterior descending artery will supply this one, this one, and the posterior medial papillary muscle. So papillary muscles, for example, let's say, uh, this is the valve. <clears throat> These are the valves. These are the corda tendini. This is the anterior portion. This is the posterior portion. Anteriorly by the LAD, posteriorly by the PDA. Are we clear? So LAD occlusion, valvular regurgitation. PDA occlusion, valvular, valvular regurgitation, as simple as that. That's why, for example, in acute myocardial infarction, right? In acute myocardial infarction, do we get a complication of mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis? Very important question. In acute myocardial infarction, do we get regurgitation or stenosis? It's very simple. Obviously, we will get regurgitation. Why? Because the blood supply will decrease. For example, this is the valve. These are the cordy tendini. The blood supply is decreased. As a result, these will get weak. So the valves will not be in place. So in terms of high pressure, the valves will regurgitate upwards. As a result, patients will have a new onset diastolic murmur. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? What are some of the most common causes of mitral stenosis or stenosis? This can happen due to a lot of different reasons, most commonly being rheumatic fever, right? Rheumatic fever, we can get, um, for example, uh, endocardial, uh, I mean, infectious endocarditis and occlusions, right? Drug abuse and all of those other things and connective tissue disorders. These are some of the reasons of mitral stenosis. So that's a, in a, in a minus, in, a, in terms of mitral stenosis, we'll get a diastolic or a systolic murmur. <clears throat> in terms of mitral stenosis, will we get a diastolic murmur or a, or a systolic murmur? That's the answer, please. Right? Mitral stenosis, diastolic murmur, very good. In terms of mitral regurgitation, do we get a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur? Systolic murmur. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. That's it. Now, let's talk about the blood supply of the nodes, S node and AV node. S node and AV node, both are supplied by the right coronary artery. Okay. Uh, I need you guys to understand one thing very clearly. The concept has to be very clear. Let me talk about this. The heart, the concept that I'm gonna talk about is, I'm pretty sure you guys know this. I'm just, this is just a, re, this is just a repeat of information. The heart, does it need a uh, nerve innervation by the central nervous system to function? The answer is yes. Right? The central nervous system, especially the autonomic portion of the central nervous system will innervate the heart. It helps sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers, and they will increase or decrease the 
heart rate and the force of contractions basically. But if we do not have the central nervous system innervation, can the heart beat on its own? The answer is yes. How? The heart has its own electrical circuit. Yes. The heart has its own electrical, electrical circuit. We have the SA node, AB node. We have that the heart bundles of his and all of those things that allows the heart to beat on its own. Now, when we say something like this, when we say heart block, what do we mean? Layman's who are not physicians who think about heart block as blood vessels that are blocked with an emboli. But as physicians, we have to know that heart block is not talking about, we're not talking about the atherosclerotic block of the blood vessels. What we are talking about is the block in the conduction pathway from AC to AB node, AB node to the rest of the conduction system. Is that clear, yes or no? Yes, okay. This is a very simple information. A lot of people are not over, really aware what the heart block is. So that's it. Okay, so that's it. Let's, let's move forward to the next one. That is dominance. If the posterior descending artery arises from the right coronary artery, we call this a right dominant circulation. This is majority of the, pop of the population, close to around 80%. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say 60 to 80%. And the left dominant circulation of the, uh, is basically a condition where the posterior descending artery arises from the left circumflex, not the left anti-descending. A lot of people, they make this mistake. So that's it. And co-dominant means that the PDA will arise from both left circumflex or right coronary artery. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Just give me one second. Okay. Let's move forward. Cardiovascular physiology. Is everyone ready with cardiovascular physiology? Okay. These uh, these are some um, basically these are some equations and. Uh, from where you will get a lot of questions related to physiology, certain questions related to certain drugs and diseases, which we will talk about. But uh, these are basically cardiac output variables. What do we mean by variables? Variables are basically factors that can affect the cardiac output, as simple as that, right? Meaning that the cardiac output is dependent on these five factors. Number one, stroke volume. Number two, contractility. Number three, preload. Number four, Afterload number five, myocardial oxygen demand. So based on these factors, the cardiac output will vary. Either it will increase or either it will decrease. As simple as that. That's what we mean by variables. Number one, let's 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 talk about the first factor that can affect cardiac output. What is cardiac output? Cardiac output is basically the amount of blood that is being expelled out of the heart to enter into the systemic circulation. As simple as that. So what is stroke volume? Stroke volume is basically the volume of blood that will eject with each contract, which, with each contraction of the left ventricle. So obviously, if stroke volume is the amount of blood that is being ejected with, uh, each, con with each contraction of the heart. So over here, if I draw the heart, right? If I draw the heart, the left ventricle is responsible for pushing the blood into the system of circulation, or is the right ventricle responsible for pushing the blood into the system of circulation? Left answer, please. Left, very simple. So, number one, stroke volume. Stroke volume is basically the amount of blood that is leaving the left ventricle and entering into the system of circulation in simple terms. So number one, if the left ventricle contracts more, will there be more volume of blood that will leave the heart or less volume of blood that will leave the heart? Very, very simple, more, very good. If we, have, if we have a high pressure or a high resistance over here, will we have high amount of blood leaving the heart or low amount of blood leaving the heart? If the pressure is high, of course, then we will have low amount of blood that will leave the heart because the, there's a high resistance over here, right? What is this resistance called? This resistance is called, in terms of cardiac physiology, this resistance is called what? Peripheral vascular resistance, very good. And what else? This is called cardiac afterload, very good. 
cardiac afterload. So what is cardiac afterload? Cardiac afterload is basically the resistance which the heart has to work against to push the blood out. Okay. What is, okay, next one. Next one is what if there's a high amount of blood that, that's flowing into the left ventricle? Will the left ventricle contract more? Yes or no? With the high amount of blood? Yes or no? If there's a high amount of blood that flows into the left ventricle, the left ventricle will contract more. If the left ventricle contract, contracts more, can it push the blood more efficiently? Yes or no? By Frank Starling's law, do you remember Frank Starling's law? The answer is yes. So if there's increased flow of blood, will the stroke volume increase or will it decrease? Fast answers, please. Will it increase or will it, will it decrease? They will increase. So what is that increased flow, flow of blood? What is that force called? The force with which the blood enters the left atrium, the left ventricle. This is called, this force is called. Last chances, please. This, this force is called what? Preload. Yes, very good. So stroke volume, number one, stroke volume with the increased contractility. Will stroke volume increase or decrease? Last answers. Increase. With increased afterload, will stroke volume increase or decrease? It, with increased preload, will stroke volume increase or decrease? Very good. Number one. Now, what are some conditions where the contractility of the heart will increase? For example, in sympathetic innervation, will the heart contract more or contract less? Contract more. What are some examples of sympathetic innervation or sympathetic overactivity? For example, anxiety, exercise, right? Fear, right? These things. Uh, and that's that. Another one is in terms of a high blood volume, uh, which one will increase, preload or afterload? Pass answers, please. In case of a high blood blood volume, which one will increase? Preload. Very good. Can anyone ex can anyone name one physiological uh, condition where the blood volume is increased, especially in females and women? This is during pregnancy. Yes, in pregnancy, females have high blood volume. That's why they have higher preload. Okay. So if the heart of a pregnant mother is not uh, functioning properly and there's high amount of preload, isn't there a possibility that uh, these mothers can suffer from peripartum cardiomyopathies and heart failures? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's a different discussion. We will not go into this. Stroke volume is dependent on contractility, preload, afterload. We have to remember this. Did we understand this? Yes or no? Okay, next one. Let's talk about the next variable the, or, the, or the next factor. That is contractility. Which, what contractility are we talking about? We're talking about the contractility of the myocardium, right? So over here, first and foremost, the contractility means the force with which the muscle is contracting, especially, especially the heart muscles. So will this force or contraction increase in sympathetic innervation or parasympathetic innervation? The answer is it will increase with sympathetic innervation. How will the sympathetic innervation increase the contractility? That is the next question. The sympathetic innervation will release neurotransmitters, for example, epinephrines, norepinephrines, and all of those others are sympathetic or uh, sympathetic neurotransmitters. What they will do is that they will come and then they'll bind to the receptors, alpha receptor, beta, beta receptors alpha receptors and the beta receptors. The heart does not have alpha receptors. The heart has beta receptors, especially beta one receptor. So they'll come and then they'll bind to the beta one receptor. When they come and bind to the beta one receptor, they will activate protein kinase A. This will lead to the activation of a phosphoprotein or a, or a protein, which we, which, we call the, which we call as phospholamban. Okay, you do not have to remember this, the name possible lamban. It's not very, very high yield. You, there's, there's not really any diseases associated with this. So the sympathetic innervation will come and bind to the beta-1 receptor. As a result, there will be activation of the second messenger system, protein kinase A. As a result, there will be phosphorylation of a protein called phospholamban. And this will increase calcium ATPase activity. As a result, increased amount of calcium will get um, stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this 
increased amount of calcium that is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum will allow the increased release of <laughs> calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what happens is, for example, let's say that this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum where calcium is being stored, SR for sarcoplasmic reticulum. So whenever these uh, beta-1 receptors are activated with the sympathetic innervation, they will cause activation of protein kinase A. Protein kinase A will push more calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But doesn't the sarcoplasmic reticulum already have calcium that's stored inside? Yes or no? Yes? The answer is yes. So if you push more calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which already has stored calcium, can extra calcium come out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Yes or no? <clears throat> the answer is yes. This is called calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, calcium-induced calcium release. Now, what would the what will this excess calcium do? Will this contract the smooth muscles? <clears throat> yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. As a result, will the force of contraction increase or decrease? The answer is the force of contraction will increase. So this is called calcium-induced calcium release by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, can anyone tell me if there is a receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is mutated and there's excessive release of calcium, what is the name of this disease? Excessive release of calcium due to a mutation of one of the receptors of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Can anyone name this, this condition? There are two conditions. One is anyone malignant hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Yes, one is under the presence of a succinylcholine, another one is under the presence of a first generation antipsychotic. Yes, I know what is the name of the receptor of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which if undergoes mutation will have excessive release of calcium. The name of that receptor is, please tell me the name of the receptor. Anyone? Nope. Anyone? Have you guys heard of ranadine receptor? Yes or no? Ranadine receptor? Yes, okay. What is the name of the drug that will block the ranadine receptor and prevent neuroleptic malignant syndrome or malignant hypothermia? The name of the drug is? Very good. Dantrolene. Are we clear? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. As a result, let's move forward. Dantrolene, yes. As a result, intracellular calcium will increase, decrease extracellular sodium, and decrease activity of the sodium calcium exchanger. So more calcium will stay inside the cell, and the uh, heart can basically pump the blood with more force of contraction. Now, let's talk about the action of the sodium potassium pump. Now, what happens is over here, there's a sodium potassium pump in the cardiac uh, cell, right? In the myocytes, we have a sodium potassium pump and then we have a sodium calcium exchanger. So the thing is the sodium potassium pump, will it increase the intracellular sodium or decrease the intracellular sodium? <clears throat> the thing is if sodium potassium pump, pump, if it works more, then will sodium get out or get in? Fast answers, please. Sodium potassium pump. If, very good, if the sodium potassium pump, normally if it works more, sodium will get out, potassium will get in. But what will happen if, okay, now next one. Next one is, so what happens is in the heart, yes, very good, three sodium in, two potassium out, right? So if this, if this is the sodium potassium pump, it's functioning normally, sodium is leaving the cell and potassium is entering the cell, right? So if excessive sodium leaves the cell, there's an issue. So to maintain the sodium level, there is a sodium calcium exchanger, which maintains a normal amount of sodium. This sodium calcium exchanger, what it does is that it releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum outside and it pulls the sodium inside. Okay, are we clear about this? Let me draw this one more time. What's happening over here? Give me one second. This is, this is very, very important, very important. And as a matter of fact, you'll even get 
uh, you'll, uh, you'll be asked about this even in your residence. Let me just explain this very quickly. Okay. Now, this is the myocyte, right? In the myocyte, you have sodium potassium pump and sodium calcium exchanger. Sodium potassium pump is working to get rid of sodium and potassium will enter. To maintain the normal amount of, to maintain the normal homeostasis or the, the normal amount of sodium inside the cell, right? The calcium exchanger will release calcium outside and absorb sodium inside, okay? If there's increased activity. Are we clear up to now? Yes or no? Yes or no, pass answer please. The answer is yes. Okay. So, Next question is, what if there's a drug that comes and blocks the sodium potassium pump? Now, can the sodium leave the cell? The answer is no. If the sodium doesn't leave the cell, will the calcium need to leave the cell to make sure more sodium increases? The answer is no. As a result, will more calcium stay inside the cell? The answer is yes. If more calcium stays inside the cell, what would happen to the smooth muscle contraction? Increase or decrease? Increase. Now, what is the name of the drug that blocks the sodium potassium pump, prevents the sodium to get released and decreases the sodium calcium exchanger activity? This is? Decoxin. Okay. Now, uh, one of the physicians will explain the mechanism of decoxin activity and then I'll move forward and I'll ask this question to Dr. Ellen. Decoxin, how does decoxin work? <clears throat> Please repeat this information over here. Very important for your CBC examination. Okay, so um, the mechanism is um, for digoxin, it blocks the sodium, um, the, the, the sodium potassium channel. And then yeah. so, so by blocking the, um, blocking that, it keeps the, I guess, the <clears throat> calcium inside the cells. Okay, just uh, wait for a second over here. So if, you, if, if you're saying that uh, digoxin is going to block the sodium potassium channel, what would happen if the amount of sodium inside the cell? Will it increase or will it decrease? It would, um, it would increase. Okay, it will increase obviously because the sodium potassium pump is blocked. So now, do you need the sodium calcium exchanger to work more in order to get more sodium inside from the exocellular environment? Yes. No. Oh, no. That, that's because you already have a lot of sodium inside the cell. Do you still need more sodium inside the cell? The answer is yes no. or no? No. You, you do not need more sodium inside the cell because what are you gonna do with all this sodium inside the cell, right? There will be disruption of the normal homeostatic mechanism. So if you prevent the activity of the sodium calcium exchanger, as a result, is calcium increasing inside the cell when you block the sodium potassium pump? Yes. Yes, as a result, what would happen to the force of contraction? Increase. Very increase, very good. Thank you so much, Frankly, Really appreciate this. Next, let's ask the same question too. Who else? Who else has their exam in the next couple of uh, months, in the next six months? Does anyone have their exam in the next six months? Okay, no? Dr. S, yes. Can you explain to me how digoxin works? How does digoxin work? Yeah, so digoxin, it blocks sodium, potassium, ATP is pump, as a result of okay. which sodium remains inside the cell. So once okay. sodium stays inside the cell, so there will be no uh, calcium exchange, like the sodium calcium exchange will not take place. And so calcium will also stay inside the cell. Um, increased good. calcium will lead to increased contact. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So let's move forward. Over here. This is exceptionally high yield. So please underline this. Did everyone understand about the mechanism of action of digoxin? 
Okay. So in a patient of, of digoxin poisoning or digitalis poisoning, do we get uh, tachycardia or bradycardia? Do we get tachycardia or, or bradycardia? Tachycardia, there you go. Next one, contractility will increase, uh, contractility will decrease with, not increase with. Very simple to understand. Beta-1 receptors, they are responsible for this pathway, right? So if the beta-1 receptors are blocked by beta blockers, then contractility will decrease. Heart failure with systolic dysfunction, meaning that the heart cannot pump the blood out at, uh, in an adequate fashion. As a result, heart failure is responsible with decreased contractility. Acidosis, acidotic conditions are responsible. Why? Because the myocardium, they are, because for example, in terms of an acidosis, the lactic acid accumulation is high, right? So whenever a muscle has a high amount of lactic acid, can it contract more or does it contract less? The answer is it contracts less. For example, how many of us works out in the gym? If you work out in the gym and let's say you are hitting your biceps, right? At one point, does the bicep muscle start starts to hurt <clears throat> when we keep on working on the muscle for a long period of time? Yes or no? The answer is yes. As a result, do we stop the set? The answer is yes, right? So the contractility decreases. Why does the bicep muscle start hurting when you are curling? Right when you're when you are curling the bar, when you're curling the bar, the bicep muscle they start to hurt because the increased activity that goes on in the muscle leads to the production of lactic acid. Lactic acid will decrease the pH. As a result, this will uh, shift the metabolism from an from an anaerobic to an anaerobic source, and <clears throat> there will be increased amount of pain because of the fact that lactic acid releases a lot of prostaglandin from the arachidonic acid membrane, and you get. Uh, you, and we are aware that prostaglandin and bradykinins are responsible for causing pain. So this pain will prevent the set from growing more. Are we clear? So in the same way that how lactic acid prevents or acidosis prevents muscular contractions in the arms, they will also prevent muscular contractions in the heart. So acidosis, always remember this. Hypoxia, hypoxia, if, if patients do not have enough oxygen, once again, there will be lactic acid accumulation, acidotic environment and contractility will decrease and calcium channel blockers. If we get calcium channel blockers, contractility will also decrease because calcium cannot move inside the, I mean, if, I mean, calcium cannot enter the cell and if calcium cannot enter the cell, we just talked about the fact how calcium is responsible for causing calcium induced calcium release from the cytoplasmic reticulum. So in order for calcium to release from the cytoplasmic reticulum, it needs calcium to enter the cell so if you give someone a calcium channel blocker, calcium cannot enter the cell and they cannot induce calcium, induce calcium release. As a result, contractility will decrease. So that's that. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Contractility. Okay. Next one, preload. Obviously, if preload increases, what would happen to the cardiac output? Preload, if this increases, cardiac output is going to increase, as simple as that, right? So preload is approximated by ventricular and diastolic volume. What do we mean by end diastolic volume? For example, if this is the heart, right? The left side of the heart will contract. After it contracts, blood will move out from the left ventricle to the ascending aorta. This is known as systole. When the left ventricle is done with the portion of the, of the systolic action, it will enter the diastolic action. That is, that is, it will relax. When it relaxes, is there any contraction of the left ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is no. If there is no contraction of the left ventricle, will this create a negative pressure or will this allow the blood to flow in from the left atrium to the left ventricle? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So during this phase of relaxation, all the blood that flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle will get accumulated over here, right? And this flow and this blood will stretch the left ventricle and the left ventricle will then contract again. So that, that is systole, diastole, and then systole again. But before contraction, all the blood that stays in the left ventricle during a period of left ventricular relaxation is called diastolic volume. And all the blood that stays till the ventricular muscle relaxes to its last portion, we call this end diastolic volume. That is, that is, this is the maximum amount of blood that will enter the left ventricle during the phase of ventricular relaxation. Okay, the maximum amount of blood that will enter the left ventricle during the phase of ventricular relaxation is called end diastolic volume. So obviously, if more blood is coming into the left atrium, more blood will enter the left ventricle. Yes or no? Questions, please. The answer is yes or no. The answer is yes. 
So if we have high preload, will the end diastolic volume increase or decrease? The answer is obviously if preload is high, end diastolic volume is also going to be high. Are we clear? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Thank you. So that's that. Okay. So if the blood vessels that are responsible for bringing the blood to the heart, if they contract properly, will more blood pump to the heart or less blood pump to the heart? More blood pump to the heart. If the blood vessels that are responsible for bringing the blood back to the left atrium, if they're dilated, if they're dilated, can they contract to bring the blood to the heart? Yes or no? The answer is no. Why? Because the pressure inside the blood vessel is going to decrease. As a result, not a lot of blood are going to come into the left atrium and not a lot of blood will come into the left ventricle as a result and diastolic volume will decrease. So vasodilatation can cause decrease of preload. Okay, so please remember this, especially nitroglycerins that we give in the case of uh, an angina or uh, acute ischemic attack. Nitroglycerin is given to decrease preload. Okay, so that's it. Afterload, what is afterload? Afterload is basically the pressure that the heart has to work against to push the blood out. Yes or no? So if, if there's a high afterload, is there a high pressure outside of the heart? The answer is obviously yes. So will the heart more? work more to push the blood out? The answer is yes. So will cardiac output increase or will cardiac output decrease if there's a high resistance? The answer is cardiac output will decrease. Very simple, right? So that's that. Uh, increased wall tension will increase pressure that will increase afterload, not important. Uh, don't worry about this. Worry about the fact that, um, why does afterload increase? Please worry about this. One of the most common cause of increase of afterload is increase of mean arterial pressure. That is in case of long-term hypertension, long-standing hypertension. If there's a long-standing hypertension, there's increase of mean arterial pressure. If mean arterial pressure is very high, that means afterload is very high. If afterload is high, will the heart work more or work less to push the blood out? The answer is it will work more. If it works more, the myocardium of the left ventricle, will it undergo hypertrophy or atrophy. Yeah, the, under, the thing is, it'll undergo hypertrophy. As simple as that. <clears throat> okay. So that's basically what it is. Afterloads are important to understand because AC inhibitors and ARB will decrease both preload and afterload. How? They will decrease preload because blood volume will decrease. Can anyone tell me how does blood volume decrease with ACE inhibitors and ARB? Aldosterone is high or low in ARBs and ACE? The thing is aldosterone is, aldosterone secretion is obviously low. If aldosterone secretion is low, will more water be, uh, will, re, will more water be reabsorbed or less water will be reabsorbed? The answer is the less water will be reabsorbed. As a result, blood volume will decrease and preload will decrease. Another thing is after load. After load is dependent on uh, vasoconstriction, right? So if angiotensin is a very potent vasoconstrictor, if we give ACE inhibitors, angiotensin will also decrease. As a result, there will be less vasoconstriction and less afterload. Are we clear? Yes or no? Another way, if we give an arterial vasodilator, for, for example, we give, the, we give someone hydrelazine, will it dilate the peripheral arteries or constrict the peripheral arteries? The answer is it will dilate. If it dilates, will it increase the pressure to, I mean, will it increase the resistance? The answer is no, it will decrease the resistance. As a result, arterial vasodilators will decrease the afterload. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Next one is myocardial oxygen demand. Now, um, if you have to work more, let's talk about you. Let's say you are exercising. Do you need more oxygen or, or less oxygen? Do you need more oxygen or less oxygen? You need more oxygen. What would happen if you have less, less oxygen? Can you work out properly? Okay, right? So that's it. So as a result, for your muscles to contract, 
it needs more oxygen. And the more uh, work the muscle needs to conduct, it needs more oxygen because with the increased amount of oxygen, let me tell you what happens. With the increased amount of oxygen, what happens is we have breakdown of glucose, right? Because oxygen is, is responsible for conducting the biochemical pathways. We have the breakdown of glucose by glycolysis, and then it enters the TCA cycle, then it enters the electron transfer chain where we need oxygen to activate the complex five that is ATP synthase, right? ATP synthase. If there is no ATP, there is no uh, there is no ATP in the mitochondria. And you know, the first thing that we ever read in biology is that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, right? So if ATP is not there, will mitochondria function properly? The answer is no, right? So as a result, if oxygen is not there, then contractility is not there, as simple as that. Vice versa, for increased contractility, do you need more oxygen or less oxygen? The answer is you need more oxygen or less oxygen? More oxygen, right? So increased contractility will increase the oxygen demand. Increase afterload. If there's an increased afterload, will the heart work more or work less? Fast answers, please. It will work more. If it works more, does it need more oxygen or less oxygen? The answer is it needs more oxygen or less oxygen? More oxygen, very good. If the heart rate is high, if the heart rate is high, does it need more oxygen or less oxygen? More oxygen. Okay, if the wall tension is high, does it uh, increase the oxygen demand or decrease the oxygen demand? No matter what you say, right? Everything will increase the oxygen demand, as simple as that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Are you guys understanding the lecture? Yes or no? Is everyone understanding the lecture? Okay, good. Is everyone understanding my voice, my pronunciations, my pace of speaking, right? My accent? Okay, good. So whenever you guys have any issues understanding anything regarding the lecture, if there are noises, if there's any accent problem, if there's any pronunciation problem, if there's any problem with the pace of the lecture, please let me know. Uh, next question, how long? Uh, what, how long what? Dr. S, would you be kind enough to elaborate your question? How long means, are you asking how long is the lecture going to take place? How long will we cover the whole physio? How long is the class? The class is still 1.30. Are you guys tired? Yes or no? Do you, do, do you guys want to stop here? Do you guys want to stop here or not? Yes? Okay. Okay, so are you guys happy with the amount of pages we did today? From first day, we finished a lot of topics today, didn't we? We finished embryology, we finished anatomy, we finished a uh, very important topic on physiology. Are you guys happy or are you guys willing to uh, cover more pages in the future? Is, is this the amount of, I mean, the amount of pages that, that we did today, is this, a, is this enough or should we cover more pages in the future? Can I get some feedbacks, please? Because feedbacks from the students are very important. That way it will allow me to construct my lectures. Is this enough or should we do more? Okay. Oh, uh, okay, so we have a question from Dr. Tasneem over here. The third question is, can you repeat ACE and ARB mechanism? Yes. Whenever we block angiotensin production, do we have high aldosterone or low aldosterone? Fast answer, please. Dr. Tasneem. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If you block angiotensin or ARBs, then you decrease aldosterone. If you decrease aldosterone, will we have more water reabsorption or less water reabsorption? As a result, will blood volume increase or will blood volume decrease? If blood volume decreases, what would happen to the preload? Will it be high or will it be low? Dr. Tassin, if blood volume is decreased, what would happen to the preload? Will it be high or will it be low? Hello. So that's that. Have you understood the mechanism of ACE inhibitors and ARBs? Okay. Now, are we ready to do some questions from MBOSS? Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Or do you guys want to take a short break before we begin the questions from MBOSS? 
Do you guys want a short five minute break before we begin the questions? Yes or no? Okay, so let's take a short five minute break. Thank you so much. And let's come back.
Okay, can everyone hear my voice, yes or no? <clears throat> can everyone hear my voice? Is everyone back from the break? Very good and very well. Thank you so much for keeping your attention in the class. I know it's not easy because it's a long class, right? It's, it's a pretty lengthy class. And if you are aware of how um, the human attention it works, are you guys aware that the human attention keeps on shifting each and every 90 seconds? Yes or no? Right? There are only a handful of people in this entire world who can actually concentrate on a single topic for a long period of time, especially monks. Have you heard of monks? You know, they practice concentration. Right. Okay. Let me give you a very small example of uh, concentration and discipline. First and foremost, how many of us have been, um, for example, there was this one motivational video which I was seeing on YouTube, and it was a funny. It was actually a very good one. I'm not sure if you guys have seen that or not, but there's this thing about concentration. The thing is, when we are little, right? Our parents and our teachers, they always ask us to concentrate, but do they really teach us to concentrate, right? Does anyone teach, can anyone teach you to concentrate or does anyone teach you to concentrate? The answer is yes or no. No, right? Everyone always asks you to concentrate, but please concentrate on this topic. Please concentrate on that topic. And they think that by, by saying, please, this will allow you to concentrate, <clears throat> right? Even, even me as a teacher right now, I ask you guys to concentrate on different topics. But the thing is, the best way you can practice okay, concentration and distraction, right? Concentration and distraction, these are the most opposite thing. So that the thing is, if you're, all, if you're not concentrating on a single thing, right? If you're not concentrating on a single thing, are you being distracted by that by something else? The answer is yes. So in an entire day, if you divide your entire day on concentration and distraction, right? If you divide your entire day on whatever task you do, for example, waking up in the morning, making your bed, making your breakfast, uh, studying, doing a job, taking care of your family, everything, either you can do it while you're concentrated on doing the task or you can be distracted while you're doing the task. So the thing is, if you do not practice concentration, then you're always going to be going to be distracted, right? Because if you're not concentrated, you're going to be distracted. The thing is, some people, they get so used to being distracted that they forget how to concentrate on anything else. So 365 days a year, they're always distracted, right? So for example, if the teacher is saying something else, they they're actually thinking about, oh, what am I going to do today? Who am I going to go out with? What am I going to eat, right? So the thing is, you always get time to think about these things. So um, there, there was this one thing which I used to do in my medical school when I was a student, is that to avoid distraction, what I would always do is that I would try to keep the teacher, I would try to keep the teacher at my focus, right? I would always try to sit at the first benches. Because if I sat at the first bench, then I would be less distracted, I would not think about what's happening er around me or in my back, right? So that I would always try to make sure that, that the teacher is right over here. So the thing is, this is one way of practicing concentration. Another way of practicing concentration is whenever you're doing something, concentrate on that thing and that thing only. If you're studying, st focus only on studying. If you're playing or partying, please focus on playing and partying. Do not think about studying. You understand what I mean? For example, let's say there's another way you can practice concentration. The way that you can practice concentration is whenever you, whenever you start a task, whenever you start a task, make sure you finish the task. For example, let's say you sit down at your table and you're studying, that's you starting the task. If you do not clean your table after you're done with your studying, then your task is not finished. So the fact that you will take that extra time to finish that process of studying will allow you to concentrate more in the future. If you wake, if you sleep in your bed and you wake up in the morning and you don't make your bed, right? And you do not make your bed, then is the task of sleeping over? Yes or no? The answer is the task of sleeping is not over. 
So the task of sleeping is only over when you wake up in the morning and you make your bed. So that's how you concentrate it. So let's all try to keep this piece of information with us because the reason being is because for the next six to 12 months, you will need a lot of concentration to make sure that you remember all the information for the USMB step one. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Right? So in order to prevent feeling overwhelmed, in order, in order to make sure that we are concentrated at, at all times, we need to practice being more concentrated. You need to practice being more concentrated. After the class is over, let's say you guys plan on watching an episode of, let's say a sitcom, right? Let's say you plan on watching an episode of Friends. When you do that, I really want you to focus on that episode of Friends. I, I really don't want you to focus on, on anything else. Do you understand what I mean? Or let's say right after you're done studying, please stop thinking about studying and think about the thing which you're gonna do next. But when you're studying, please make sure that you only focus on studying. You understand what I mean? Okay, so this is the best way. This is just an advice for the next couple of days to come, right? So that you guys can practice more and more concentration and we can all be less and less distracted in our daily tasks. With that being said, let's begin, okay? Cardiovascular system, endocrine system, Let's begin. How many questions are we are we going to do today? With one thirteen, let's start with ten questions, and then eventually we'll move forward. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay, let's begin. Okay. Hmm. Let's start with this. Uh, which of the following describes the ejection fraction in this patient? Ejection fraction. What is the equation for ejection fraction? We have not talked about this. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Let me just give me one second. Okay. Ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is stroke volume by n diastolic volume. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Okay. So what is stroke volume? Stroke volume is n diastolic volume minus n systolic volume. So you take this equation and you place it over here and we get this amount. Let's see what the equation is. Further evaluation shows the systemic vascular resistance of 35 with an N systolic volume of 80. Which of the following describes the ejection fraction in this patient? Let's look at the answer. Since we have not done this question, first of all, this is the stroke volume. What is the stroke volume? In order for us to measure the ejection fraction, we need the stroke volume first. So <clears throat> the stroke volume is basically heart rate times cardiac output, right? So, uh, I mean, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So, stro so stroke volume is cardiac output divided by heart rate. So as a result, stroke volume is two by 100 because the cardiac output, I mean, the heart rate is 100 and the cardiac output is how much? Uh, uh, systemic vascular resistance and systolic volume of this. So over here, the cardiac output is around um, two liters. And how did they come up with this? There's another measurement for cardiac output. Cardiac output can be measured by mean arterial pressure divided by systemic vascular resistance. So if the mean arterial pressure is uh, one third of the, of the systolic plus two third of the diastolic, then it comes to around 70. No? And then from this mean arterial pressure, we divide this by the systemic vascular resistance that is around 35, right? 35. So let, let me just repeat this information one more time. First and foremost, we have to measure ejection fraction, right? For ejection fraction, the ejection fraction is, the ejection fraction is stroke volume divided by, what? Stroke volume divided by end systolic or end, end diastolic? It's divided by end diastolic, okay? End diastolic volume. Now, stroke volume is, for example, cardiac output is, stroke volume times heart rate, okay? So if we have to measure stroke volume from over here, do we first have to measure cardiac output, yes or no? Yes. So what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is one third systolic plus two third diastolic. So if it's 90 by 60, so it's one third times 90 plus two third times 60 comes to around 70. Right? Okay. So what is um, 
uh, oh, wait just one second. So cardiac, this is not cardiac, my apologies. This is, mean, this is mean arterial pressure. Let me just take another blank page. One second, I apologize for the mess. Okay, one more time, okay. We have to measure ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is stroke volume divided by and diastolic volume. Stroke volume is basically, we can find this by the fact that cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So stroke volume is cardiac output by heart rate. From the question, we know that the heart rate is 100. Do we know the cardiac output? The answer is no. So let's measure the cardiac output. Cardiac output is mean arterial pressure divided by systemic vascular resistance. Mean arterial pressure, let's calculate mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is one third systolic plus two third diastolic. So that's one by three times 90 by 60. So 90 plus two third times 60. The answer comes to around 70. You divide this by 35. That is the systemic vascular resistance. So your cardiac output comes to around two liters. Now you have the cardiac output over here. That is two. The stroke volume is two by 100. That's 0 0.02. Okay. Now, if this is the stroke volume, then what is the ejection fraction? That's the question. So the ejection fraction is the ratio of stroke volume to the end diastolic volume over here. So what is the uh, end diastolic volume in, in this patient? If there's end systolic volume of 80 over here, okay, give me one second, right? Okay, so the end diastolic volume is basically stroke volume plus end systolic volume, right? So if the stroke volume is 0 0.02 or 20 milliliter, right? So if, the stroke volume is 0 0.02, 0 0.002, or the value is 20 milliliter. So end diastolic volume is stroke volume plus end systolic volume. That's around 20 plus 80. So that's 100, right? As a result, what is ejection fraction? Ejection fraction is stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. So stroke volume is 20, end diastolic volume is 100. As a result, the, the ejection fraction is always in percentage. So it is, it is how much? Uh, 20 by 100, that's 10%, 0.2%, okay, or, or 0 0.2. Are we clear, yes or no? Too much calculation, yes. As you can see that this is a very difficult question. But are we clear, yes or no? Okay. <clears throat> So what did this question do? Did this question use up all the equations? Yes or no? Did this question use all the equations? The answer is yes. No. Let me tell you something very quickly, very quickly. Uh, in the examination, you will get 15 minutes to prepare before you begin. So in those 15 minutes, either you can learn how to work the app, uh, the simulation, or you can use those 15 minutes for remembering these things. Give me one second. For remembering the equations. Uh, do we have any students from the previous batch? Anyone who were there with me in the second or first batch of our step one lectures? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, okay, so Dr. Nafisa is here. Do you guys remember how in the first and the second batches, I asked everyone that before you sit for the exam, make sure that you remember all of these equations and you write it down in a piece of paper? Yes, okay. So basically, before your exam begins, you will get 15 minutes where you will either go through a phase of tutorial. 15 minutes is tutorial. So a lot of students, they do not need the, the tutorial because the tutorial is the same as functioning in the U world. So what they do is that they use those 15 minutes to write down all the equations they remember from their memories on a piece of paper. So throughout the whole exam, will it be easy for you to refer to this equation page whenever they need you to calculate something? The answer is yes. Okay. 
as simple as that. So that's it. So if you guys want to practice these equations, please go to the last page of first state from time to time, try to see if you can write this down, all the equations. It, this will be much easier after we have discussed the entire first state. But if it's possible, please try to go through this and uh, try to see if you can write this down in 15 minutes or not. If you can, then this will help you in your exam, as simple as that. Next question. Which of the following is the most likely predisposing factor for this patient's current condition? 59 year old man is brought, to the, is brought to the ER. Physical examination shows three out of six mid diastolic murmur. Blood culture shows gram positive. Uh, Catalase negative. Gram gamma hemolytic cocci and chain that are unable to grow in a 6.5% sodium chloride. Okay, so basically what they're trying to tell you is that this is basically a gamma hemolytic catalase negative gram positive. Is, is it staph or strep? Is it, is it staph or strep? The answer is, this is a description of a strep, okay? Especially, I think the answer is B, streptococcus bovis or streptococcus gallolyticus. In patients of colon cancer, always remember this, colon cancer patients, if we ever get uh, gamma hemolytic cocci that are unable to grow in 6.5% sodium chloride, we'll talk about this microbiology. These indicate that the bacterium is streptococcus bovis, right? And streptococcus bovis or gallolyticus will only take place when a patient has colon cancer and the blood is and the organism is released in the bloodstream. So if there is a patient with this sort of vegetation, doesn't this indicate that the patient have an underlying carcinoma? Yes or no? The answer is yes. What type of carcinoma? The answer is colon cancer, colon carcinoma. Are we clear? Yes or no? Everyone? Okay. Next one. Okay, the patient is at greatest risk for which of the following adverse effects of this new drug. The new drug is empagliflozin. Please tell me the right answer for this book, by the way. This is empagliflozin B, very good. Vaginal candidiasis. This is an SGLT2 inhibitor. We have done this before. Let's move forward. Further evaluation is most likely to show which of the following findings. Okay, what's wrong with the patient? Look. Okay, the potassium is sort of high. Sodium is okay. 48-year-old woman comes to the physician for blood pressure monitoring. She has been treated twice for kidney stones and increasing weakness. Her current medications include misinopril and amlodipine. She weighs 31, blood pressure is high. 24-hour indicates elevated nocturnal blood pressures. Can anyone tell me the right answer for this? Look at the calcium level. Calcium level is also very high. Can anyone tell me the right answer for this? Anyone? Okay. Anyone? Recurrent kidney stones, high BMI, high blood pressure, hypercalcemia. What do you think the diagnosis is? Further evaluation is most likely to show which of the following. Please tell me you guys know the correct answer for this. This one is. Yes, increased serum parathyroid, right? Isn't there a possibility that this patient should have, uh, if there is elevated high blood pressure and hypercalcemia, doesn't this click two boxes of MEN2A? Yes or no? Doesn't this increase two boxes of MEN2A, right? So, so this high calcium level could be due to the fact that there is a parathyroid adenoma or hyperparathyroidism. Okay, so that's it. The hormone transported by these carrier proteins is most likely for which one? Fast antibodies. Very easy question. We have done this before. This one is they're talking about postrepiatory hormones. Which which one of this is the correct answer? Okay, very good. Histopathological examination of the affected tissue is most likely to show what? Two days after being admitted for MI, 61-year-old man has sharp chest pain that works with inspiration and improves with leaning forward. This is your example of what? What is the diagnosis for this patient? Scratchy heart sound. What is the diagnosis for this patient? Pericarditis. In pericarditis, do we get lymphocyte or neutrophil? The answer is we get neutrophilic infiltrations, right? This is due to the fact that we have release of mediators, TNF-alpha, interleukin-2 and interleukin-6, 
and they cause neutrophilic exudation. Okay. And we usually see this one to three days after uh, MI. Are we clear or not? Yes or no? Are we clear? Okay. In an EKG or an ECG, what, uh, what sort of uh, findings do we get for pericarditis? Very good. Diffused ST elevations. Okay. Diffuse ST elevations. Let me see. Look at this. Two and me two, you have ST elevations. Right? That's that. Okay. ST elevations, pay cardio diffusion. Oh, in acute pay card uh in acute pay card artists. Okay. ST elevations and PR depressions. Okay. Acute ST elevations and PR depression. Can anyone tell me what type of ECG finding we get in a patient of cardiac tamponade? Okay. In a patient of cardiac tamponade, what do we get? Do we get ST elevation or alternative electric impulses or electric alterants? The answer is we get Electric alterants, I'll talk about this later. Okay, remember this uh, EKG finding. This will be important. Okay, next one of which of the following is most likely to improve this patient's symptoms? A 51 year old man comes to physician because of worsening chest pain. She was diagnosed with coronary artery disease. At the time of the diagnosis, she was able to walk for 15 minutes. Her current medications include aspirin, metoprolol, statin, and acesorbide dinitrate. Pulse is 55, blood pressure is this, treadmill shows an onset of chest pain after 15 minutes, meaning that. She has an acute occlusion. Which of the following is most likely to improve these patients, this, this patient's symptoms? Okay, let me see if you guys can understand uh, which one to choose from over here. This patient has uh, atherosclerotic narrowing of an artery. And uh, whenever there is increased force of contraction, there's increased myocardial oxygen demand. And the oxygen demand depends on blood flow. Blood flow is not taking place because there's a block in the artery. So that's that. What do we do? Very good. The answer for this one is B. That is we uh, prevent isosorbide dinitrate at night. Why do we prevent? Because long-term, uh, if we give isosorbide dinitrate at night, what, what would happen is that patients can get uh, somewhat resistant or tolerant to the isosorbide, uh, to the isosorbide uh, dinitrate. But the thing is, if there's a patient of angina who's taking a nitrate, as you can see over here, four times daily, these patients are more likely to get uh, uh, desensitized or they, uh, or they develop tolerance. So whenever you need to prescribe nitroglycerin in the future for emergency purposes, you cannot prescribe this because it will not work properly. So in these patients, we usually advise them to decrease the dose of the isosorbide dinitrate and we prevent giving it at night, number one. Number two is, after doing this, the next best step is what? So, uh, the next best step is we, we should perform our coronary angiograph. This is the next best step, okay, to see what sort of narrowing the patient has. Are we clear or not? Yes or no? If the patient has more than 70% occlusion of the left anterior descending artery, do we have to perform cardiovascular interventions? Yes or no? Coronary interventions? The answer is yes, okay. Let's move forward. An investigative study in cardiovascular changes in athletes. Patients run on a treadmill at low, moderate, and high intensity, at high intensity intervals. After each interval, an echocardiogram is performed and blood samples are collected. Which of the following sets of findings will be present in an athlete following a moderate uh, intensity interval? Now, okay, athlete. Uh, okay, please try to see if you can uh, make the correct diagnosis for this one. Okay, so we have one physician who said E. What about the other physicians? B. See? Very good. So cardiac output is going to be increased. Venous pH will not be high. Lactic acid accumulation will decrease the venous pH. So obviously your answer will narrow down to either B or C. And when, you, when your answer gets narrowed down to B or C, then B is the obvious choice of answer over here because C is not associated 
with uh, with an athlete because athletes will not have decreased cardiac output. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. Next one. Which of the following uh, is the most likely cause of this patient's presentation? Two weeks after undergoing a, a cap for unstable angina, he has decreased urinary output. Okay, this is very easy. Uh, he takes naproxen, his temperature is this. Examination shows mottled reticulated purpose, par, uh, purplish discoloration of the skin and is keeping changes on the right big toe. Now look, Whenever anyone undergoes angiography and uh, we try to basically try to see the blood vessels and we introduce dyes and uh, intervention procedures, if there, is a, if there is a cholesterol in the blood vessels, can it get uh, dislodged into, into somewhere else? The answer is yes. And the most common place where it will get, it will, it, where it will get dislodged to is in the renal system. So the answer for this one is cholesterol embolization. Okay, you have to remember this. this is a very high yield diagnosis. And in also cholesterol embolizations, patients will have purplish discoloration, mottled reticulated appearance, and kidney biopsy will show, will show these types of cholesterol embolized right? lipid droplets. And yeah, as you see, the eosinophil count will also increase a little bit. So that's it. This is exceptionally high yield. If you want, please write this down in your book. Patients undergoing angiography are at risk of developing cholesterol embolize, which can present the sign symptom of acute kidney injury. Okay. Next one. 72 year old man with congestive heart failure is brought to the ER because of chest pain, shortness of breath and palpitation. ECG shows wide complex tachycardia with a P wave of 105. Uh, intravenous pharmacotherapy is initiated with a drug that prolongs the QORS and QT intervals. Okay, uh, there's a possibility you will not know this. The drug that prolongs QRS and QT interval is quinidine. I'll talk about this later when I talk about antiarrhythmic drugs. Okay, antiarrhythmic drugs. Are we clear? Okay, everyone. Okay, so with that being said, we're done with the class for today. Thank you so much for attending the first subscribe class for the lecture. Um, if you guys have friends who wants to join USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK, we're still taking in students because uh, two or three students are not going to uh, come and fill the spot up. So we still have a, a couple of slots that are empty. So please ask them to come and contact us very uh, as soon as possible. Next one is uh, the recordings. Where are we going to get the recordings for this one? Okay, where are we going to get the recordings for this one now? Um, over here, I need you guys to join a group. The group is, okay, over here, I need you guys to join this group. Dr. Hyderi step one discussion group. Okay, I thought that I would open another group, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the same group over here. Um, for now at least, or um, you know what, I, actually just let me, just give me some time to think about this because this group is actually limited to a certain amount of students. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, there's a possibility that I might make another group. I'm not really sure if I have made my mind about this, but for now, you guys will be receiving the recording in your um, email address, okay? And if you guys did not receive the recording in your email address tomorrow, please let me know. Please let me know tomorrow so that um, I can give you the recordings in the class. The next one is, what do you guys do when you receive the recording? The way that you'll receive the recording is, do I have everyone's attention? Yes or no? Is everyone hearing my voice? Okay. How do you download the recording? So this is how I'm gonna send you the recordings. The recordings are basically going to be sent like this. So I'm gonna share, and then I'm gonna share it to, for example, like this, right? So I'm pasting it and that's that. So what, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna press on this and you're gonna get the recording like this. This screen will come. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a download option. You click on it and then you download it. So you'll only get access for 48 hours to download the lecture or the recording. If you do not download in the next 48 hours, the lecture will disappear. And then you'll have to wait for a long period of time to uh, basically 
get it because we usually delete our recordings, okay? And we cannot save our recordings because Zoom only allows a certain amount of storage. So that's it. Are we clear, yes or no? Everyone, okay. The lecture for tomorrow will begin at 9.30 a.m. as today. And thank you so much. If there's anyone who is waiting for Western Union and Zell information, do not worry, we'll give it to you by today and you can complete your transactions. And with that being said, if you have any other questions, please send us an email and we'll highly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great day. Please make sure you complete your homework and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9.30. Bye-bye. Okay,